Oh, what's up? Uh, oh, my God. Yeah, it, it has been a while. I mean, <laughs> probably more than two months since I last joined this session. But I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you are studying. I hope uh, everything is going well. And I wish you success. Uh, I'm told the exams will be, I think, in April, March or April. April. Uh, I hope you take this last uh, last month to prepare. Prepare adequately. You remember what I told you um, way, way back, that the oral exams is for the students who read widely, but the by exam is for the students who read deeply. So you, you should just read between the lines. And as, of course, as you will see it, uh, in this session, if he, I used to tell people when you in KSM that CLE is not with words. So when you look at CLE exam, every sentence in that question, every sentence in the question that you will see the exam, is a reason why that sentence is there. Uh, now they don't put uh, waste words at you. They, you. You just see a sentence in the exam and then you, in the question, and then you ignore. For every question you see, for every sentence in that question, there's a reason why it has been put there. So once you get that and once you go to the exam with that mindset, and of course, what you have read, you are going to excel. So uh, of course, we will discuss to, tonight. We will see. Uh, I hope this session will be helpful, and I really wish you all the best. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Thank you very much. Lavins, then I uh, know. Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Awesome, awesome. Well, greetings, uh, everyone from this other side. Uh, been uh, been a while. I think two to three weeks of uh, um, desirable holiday to cool off your mind and let the steam off. So I think we have to start on quite um, a higher trajectory. So we need to be at our peak within the next two months to allow all of you to be in the same level at par. Because like I said, and I'll keep on saying this, that each and every time, if you don't believe in yourself, then I do believe in you. Like there is an untapped potential within you. So in 2022, learn to unravel the untapped potential that you have beneath your skin. So believe in yourself, believe that you can do it. Well, it's doable, we did it, others did it. So it's now upon you to know how uh, to play the game. Because if you do know how to play the game, then the rules will have to change. So when the CLA brings in such an exams, you don't even have to play a 4D chess. You have to grade it twice as high as you can. So play an 8D chance with all these exam papers because, like Alex said, that particular sentence in each and every question, there's a reason why it's there. So don't just, don't just ignore it. At the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, have this sentence not been here? How would this question be like? Okay, so don't just look at the scope within which uh, the CLE examiners, you know, uh, I bring before you. Ask yourself if the question is perhaps set in such a manner. How would my response be? So when you do that, sometimes when you go through questions, you're like, I don't remember about this. But if you twist it a little bit, it starts, you know, sort of bringing ideas. So you have to tap onto that and ensure that you do enrich exactly what you have in your mind. So welcome back to I do believe this uh, this is going to be quite some rigorous process. It's going to be um, an intensive engagement. I really want to call it tuition. I mean, what we are doing right now is uh, we're just trying to fill your cup. Well, if your cup is half empty, half full, depending on which side or you know, I mean, you look at it from. What we here is to try to fill that cup, perhaps give you that extra push for you to get at the peak. So like I said, um, the journey may seem quite, um, you may face a lot of bumpy rides on that particular journey that you are taking. Your exams actually are on April. I was with your CEO the other day, Dr. Mutai, just yesterday. 
on some stakeholders' engagement, and he did confirm that the exams are actually in April. So we had some lengthy talk with, uh, with him, but uh, uh, that's one thing that stood out. So your exams are in April, so you have around two months, I'd say. You have two months. So try to get where you want to be. And I'll tell you this, you can't keep on doing the same thing and expecting different results. Life doesn't work out that way. If you only used to perhaps swinging up at 8 a.m. because you have classes in the afternoon, you have to change that. You know, you have to realign exactly all the strategies you've ever been employing to try and have a different result. And best believe it will work out, 100%. So all the best in your journey. And uh, man, I wish you all the best. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the least I could do and my team could do here. Because um, you, can, you can do this. So just try to be calm. Expose your mind to, uh, to some rest. So don't just be too, too um, engaged in one thing, try to break that monotony. So like I said, like my team has uh, echoed, I will call this the final dash. So you have the tape over there, you have the finishing line. So it depends whether you'll fall off the truck or you keep on re-energizing exactly what you have beneath your muscles to get to the tape and be a history maker. So all the best once again, and I'm looking forward to quite some fruitful engagements beginning tonight until the time that the clock will freeze. So back to you, Solonga. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lavitz, for that. Now, uh, Noah, and then now we move on. Um, good evening. Uh, just to echo what my colleagues have said uh, and to add something. Uh, uh, it's true that uh, CLA, each and every sentence uh, has its own point. Now, uh, what I, I can tell you is that we are only remaining with two months and uh, it's very important that you utilize these two months and uh, uh, what I can tell you is that um, people used to tell me that during the CLE exams, I, I was very relaxed. And here is why. Uh, uh, I used to, um, uh, during that period before the CLE exams, uh, my method of study was, uh, I knew I was a very slow learner. In fact, if you ask me any question, I'll take time to think about it and answer it. So I knew myself, kill out time uh, I know some of you think, oh, CLS exams, I'm not grasping anything, I'm learning slowly, I don't know what, but uh, there's always time for everything. Uh, because uh, especially to those who feel they are a bit slow in grasping these things, you know, uh, the burden is now on you to work a, bit, a little bit harder. Because with smart work uh, and a little bit of effort, you can achieve anything. You can be able to pass the bar exams. And without uh, the same, same hard work, without you doing the smart work or the study or whatever it is, then nothing will grow but seeds. Uh, there is something that really happened during our time uh, when we were doing the CLE exams. And maybe Pareno may echo it later, that uh, on... Uh, uh, we did our criminal litigation exams on a Friday, and mm -hmm. then uh, it was a little bit uh, tricky. It was a very tricky exam. Uh, then uh, a lot of students, I don't know what happened in Russia that made them go. Then on Monday, something happened in that hall. We used to be in cooperative. I think Salonka used to be there. Cooperative used to be be full cooperative uh, university used to be full such that we need not play for you so during, on monday there were a lot of spaces in exam so i had a conversation with one of my friends who decided to defer given that uh, that, that issue the mentality that commercial exams are normally had so they were asking if criminals is this way a lot of commercial uh, exams and i can tell you for sure the commercial paper was the easiest. And that particular friend of mine, 
uh, got the eight piece correctly. So imagine if you could have just gone to that exam room, uh, you just attempt. At the end of the day, you don't know what your luck can be. You could have maybe passed. So my plea to you is that do not panic at uh, the last minute that now you will see that you are not ready. This is the time, these two months are enough. If you feel you are not grasping anything, then it's upon you now to wake up every morning uh, a little bit earlier, uh, sacrifice the sleep, uh, you know, do a lot of study, research, past papers, whatever it is, consultation. If you are a good person in a uh, group work, attempt it. Uh, work harder than you, you think you did yesterday. Yeah? So every morning when you wake up, do something extra than what you did the previous day. Because at the end of the day, winners embrace hard work. Uh, they, they normally love the discipline of it. And the losers, on the other hand, whenever they fail, they see it as punishment. And that's the difference between the two. So my prayer to you is that one, have a strategy, know yourself. Because uh, at the end of the day, hard work is an essential element normally in tracking down and perfecting a strategy or in executing it. So as long as you have a strategy on how you want to handle this uh, by exams, then so long as you inject a little bit of hard work or smart work, uh, you will, that's, that will be enough element in you know executing that particular strategy. Some of you may be lucky, but when it comes to CLE exams, it, there's no luck. It's just hard work, then do not doubt yourself. Uh, just when it comes to when May or April, whenever you're doing exams, please do not differ. Because I was having a conversation with uh, there's a lecturer in KU uh, by the name Felix Okech. Uh, actually, he's my neighbor back at home. Uh, he was telling me those people who differ, they, there's a higher probability they'll never even finish that CLE. You are quite frustrated. So even if these are this is something that is not a life or death situation, you just study whatever comes in exams, do what you can do. You'd rather have that F uh, by bad luck. You have the F, but than have that incomplete. So I pray that uh, you people uh, pass the by exams. The two hundred uh, I can see two hundred and four attendees who are here plus the rest who are coming to attend. Pray that you pass the by exams, and uh, I hope. Uh, this particular lecture that will be delivered to you, to you be insightful. Otherwise, back to you, Solanka. Ah, thank you, thank you so much. No, thank you for that. Now, the last person is thank you, from Sumaya is with us. Then I uh, will proceed to the question paper. I can see Sumaya is in. Then I will proceed to the question paper. Uh, I keep on getting uh, muted. Okay, same as Kesa, you know. Uh, so long, you can hear me. Okay, yeah, so I've seen thumbs yes, up. Yes, yes, so we can. Yes, yes. Um, hi everyone. I hope you're all doing well, and you know you're having a good um, beginning to the new year. So apologies, I'm not going to be available today for the whole session. Uh, I have something that I need to take care of, but I just wanted to drop uh, drop in and say something about commercial transactions generally and how to you know, go about um, strategizing or even yeah, how to go about answering, answering the questions. So uh, I listened in when, when Lavins and Noah was speaking and 100% makes a lot of sense. I like how Noah was very um, positive uh, this you just have two months, so I think try giving try giving it your all as much as you can. Um, start creating a strategy. So uh, again, I I think I I mentioned last year that uh, um, it depends on the kind of person you are and how you study, right? So uh, I think if you haven't if you're in a group, you know, well and good. If you're not in a group and that's how you also study, that's fine. But I think. It's really important to practice your drafting for this third semester, as I mentioned. Please, please, please do a lot of drafting exercises. During our year, I think um, CD sort of realized people don't know how to draft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we had so much drafting questions, including in, a, in our ethics paper, we had a drafting question. What's wrong? Cinder? 
I think was it ethics? Yeah, we we got something to draft on the professional undertaking. So you need to you need to be. I feel like with CLE exams, if you're good at drafting, that's an assured a uh, minimum two questions for civil litigation. There'll always be always be two two drafting questions for criminal. There'll always be like at least one or two drafting questions. So if you're good at drafting, you're already halfway into making sure you've got an a fifty and above, right? Yeah. So what I wanted to say for commercial transactions is, first of all, um. As the years go by, commercial is becoming simpler and simpler, which is a really good thing because it used to be the uni that people used to fail the most. Also, it has now been shortened, so you don't have to worry about all these other small units like agency or sale of goods or negotiable instruments. You just need to study whatever is in your course outline. So um, what what I would suggest that you know you need to be really good at, for company law, you need to be good at the basics. So you have to go back to your, to you have to go back to your company law the the first topic on the course outline company transactions you have to be good at company transactions because um you know yeah company transactions was number one and it also came in a few other questions um the year before us it was it only came i think as a two or three mark question in the, in the november paper so it's unpredictable and the fact that the units have now been reduced it means that the probability of bringing company transact- transactions becomes even higher because it's one of the basic units. Every examiner expects a student who's leaving um, KSL to know how to do company transactions. In the real world, like outside here, when you're, when you're doing pupillage, you'll, you'll, have, you'll always be going back to your company transactions, whether it's incorporating a company for a client or doing a legal opinion on you know, changing company from from a, maybe changing from one company regime to another, et cetera. So what I'd say is be like make sure you've gone through your company law. Be very um, good at it. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to cram the sections, but know the basic things. Like make sure you've read on conversion of companies. Make sure you know about shareholders. You know about directors. Those are very common questions. Make sure you have an understanding of company meetings. Yeah, make sure you know the offenses. This is a very this this question always comes up. And it's usually one of the questions people feel. Make sure you know about the offenses under the companies. Up there are a couple, whether it's um offenses uh, when it comes to fraudulent trading, etc. Yeah, so I think that's what I'd say. Number one, basics company law, and then there are also upcoming um there's this topic on financial, pay, uh, financial system payment systems, et cetera. I think there's some notes I sent some a, a while back. So if you check through KSL notes, it's a it's a fairly new unit, but there's um there's a lot that's been happening around uh, national payment systems generally and the CBK trying to regulate financial systems. So that unit is a very broad unit and um and since there's a lot of like new you know upcoming things on that area, I think it's something that you should at least be well conversant with. Right. So I, I'm not sure if the notes are still there, but I'll also send them again. I think I compiled a few during our year, but you can just go and, you know, do more research on them. Also, don't forget about insolvency. Generally, you need to be really good at both insolvency and bankruptcy. Know the procedures. That's the most important thing, knowing the procedures and the steps that are to be taken. Um, I think in our year, we, number one was administration. Um, Right. So again, just goes back to showing how important company transactions is generally. Um, yeah. So in terms of studying um, with, com- with with company law, um, I don't know, with, with uh, sorry, generally this unit uh, is a lot. To, there's a lot to read. There's a lot to read. So I don't know how, again, depending on the kind of person you are and how you read, try to structure yourself. Make sure that with the main things like the main topics like company that you at least have an idea of every unit. But you have to also be really perfect at the small unit, at the small topics. You see the small topics like um, the one for the one for drafting. Like I think in our time we were brought for franchise as one of the questions. Uh, so you have to be good at those small units. Be very good at partnerships because there's always an assured question that comes from partnerships. Always, every year. Yes. And then another thing you need to know the trends that, you know, come with commercial law. Again, I think um, Patrick mentioned this, but... It's if you get to a point where you read these papers, you'll come to see there's a way you can even predict. Like before you enter the enter your paper in April, you'll sort of have an understanding of I am I am going to expect a question that will come from partnerships. I will definitely see a question on commercial transaction, whether it's a two mark question or a ten mark question. I'm definitely going to walk in there and see something that has to do with either insolvency, bankruptcy, or financial payment systems. Probably I'll have a tax question. You see. So like that. So 
I think the good thing to do is that perfect the small units because those ones are easy. You know everything in and out on partnerships, no stuff on tax, you know, no stuff on financial payment systems, no stuff on general commercial agreements. You know, we got franchise, maybe you guys will be, pro- you'll be brought for a guarantor agreement, a trust, you know, a distributorship agreement, etc. So be like those small units, be very good at them. And then things like commercial, those the commercial transaction is very wide and it's usually a one semester, you know, it's a literally a one semester unit. For that one, at least Kunabenye, there's some units you may not be very good at, but try to be as good as, you know, in many things. When it comes to answering, there's a trick that we were told by um one of the lecturers during our time, who was also a former marker. He told us with commercial transactions, I don't want to see people writing maybe um you know just you just go to the point when it comes to the question no if you see a question is on a specific issue on partnerships maybe it's a question on general partnerships try to exhaust the topic write as much as you know about it and the reason this is important is because you might have not really gotten the marking point the examiner is looking for but the fact that you show the examiner okay you asked me on, on maybe a specific issue but i i know a lot on general partnerships generally and you go ahead and write that then that really gets you, you know, marking points. So, of course, examiners are different, but make sure your work is structured. Structure is very important. Always have an introduction. If you're talking about, if you've been asked about maybe um, the question is on uh, what's the difference between a, a franchise and a distributorship agreement, you first start by defining those two. You see, you define a franchise, you define distributorship, you give examples. Then you now come to the differentiation part. You see, the marks for introductions, you already get points. When it comes to the differentiating the two, maybe you only had two or three points. By the time the examiner is getting to that, they've already seen you satisfactorily understand the topic, even if you don't know all the points. So that's a trick with commercial. Please write anything and everything that you might know in that topic. Of course, structure it in a good way that it seems it's relevant, but like, yani yeah, don't um, yani yeah, don't short, don't should should change yourself. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah, I think that's all. Um, I, I think in a so long, we'll dive into the paper, which I think was a very, was one of the fair papers that I came across for commercial. But please make sure before you step into that paper on April, you have gone through every single commercial paper from 2015, because that's when CLE started testing. So make sure you've gone through every paper, you've understood what the question is asking, you've understood how to go about it, you have attempted a skeleton draft on how you'd answer it if you're the one in that paper. And the more you do this, the more you become better at it. So uh, there are few there are few topics that usually need case laws. So com- it's not a lot in commercial, but the few that you can, you know, have an idea. When you talk about um things, uh, when you talk about maybe director duties, those ones they have cases. You have to know at least two or three cases. You have to know the sections. There are a few things you have to at least have an idea of. Where do they appear in the in the Companies Act or in the Insolvency Act, etc. So I think that's all for commercial. Again, please focus on the four Cs and LWD going forward. I think you'll very soon you'll get your projects and your um, and your oral marks, and that's usually a game changer strategy. Is right because um, if you're looking for the most marks in commercial, it means you have to put in a bit more effort in it, as compared to maybe if you're looking for less marks in units like trial or ethics or whatever. My advice would be get um sort of. Have a, have a strategy on how you read the whole topic. Make sure at least in a week you've touched every every unit, but also focus more on the units that are hard. Like, don't waste your time reading child advocacy for three hours a week. Like, honestly, no no, no one, you know, needs, needs to read child advocacy that hard. Unless now the, the results come back and you find out that you're looking for the most marks in child advocacy, right? But these units, generally people, you know, it's fair, it's easy to pass them. Even LPM, it's a strategy, things like that. But focus a lot on the four Cs and LWD because those ones are the hardest, they're the bulkiest, and people are known to always fail them. So and I think my advice to you, till your project marks come and you're able to strategize yourself and know what you should put in more effort. In the meantime, make sure you're reading those five units a lot, especially LWD, don't take it for granted. That's a very, it's one of those units that look very easy, but it's also very easy for you to, to fail it. Like just be good at, for term three work, keep follow the teacher, draft the bills with them, go back, you know, practice term one work but i think the focus should be focused on what is hard because the the, the ones that are hard they're easy to break down and read now the ones that are easy towards exam time you will read it in short notes it's just about you know going through them and 
getting ready for the paper. Anyway, yeah, I think um that that's all I had to say today. Uh, you know, a few people have um you sh- sometimes I see some people try to WhatsApp, um uh, maybe me or Solanka or Patrick or whatever, and I'm I'm really sorry. Sometimes we don't get back to all your messages, but if it's anything urgent, please post them on the group. If it's a question or want any like help with any unit or question or whatever, just post it on the group. And I think um people can be able to respond from there, or you can just call us. I think that's that's easier because personally I don't see a lot of WhatsApp messages. My WhatsApp is flooded. But yeah, all the best you guys. Um you got this. This is the last lap. Um try giving your best. I promise you when you finish your last paper and your child advocacy paper, the relief you'll feel be a very good one. Also the same thing Noah said. If you've planned and you've registered and you're planning to register for all the units, don't defer last minute unless something comes up like maybe you're sick maybe you lose a loved one you know those are things that you cannot help sour but if you can and you've been preparing for that unit don't don't defy it other people other people usually plan differently like some people plan from the beginning to just do four units and they stick to that if that's your strategy again that's good do that stick on that but my advice is once you finish yourself you start privilege things get really hard you, you won't have time you won't have the same time like you have right now to do group work to study to whatever so if you can just do your best if they don't if the exams don't go well that's another different story but right now you have all the resources you have all the time you have all the support you have all your classmates studying with you you know any you're in this together so you as much as you can like put that mentality of deferring away start reading all the units equally um and of course unless it's the easy ones and you don't need to read them as much as the hard ones but also focusing on some few units and not focusing on others what leads to last minute panic and they need to defarm. So try to kill that need by have a proper timetable. Like in a day, you can read two different units. You can read a hard one and an easy one. That's what we used to do um, with my group. We used to do like in the morning, we do something hard like commercial. In the evening, we relax with child advocacy. The next day, we do something like criminal in the morning. In the evening, we're reading something like ethics, you see. So there's also a way you can structure yourself to make sure that you're balancing the units, but at least you're not also overemphasizing on some. And, you know, that will make you panic at the end. Yeah, so I think we'll talk more. Hopefully next week I'll join you guys for the paper we'll be doing fully. But, yeah, I just wanted to see that for now. Thank you and all the best, guys. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Sumaya. It's always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure. Now, I think that's it. Or if there's someone who's here and I'm locking them out, kindly just unmute. But I think uh, I think that's it. Because I'm only seeing Sumaya, Alex. So I think it's safe if we jump right to the paper, uh, which shows. As usual, I'll highlight it on the screen and then now we'll proceed to let me just see. Let me project it on the screen and then now we'll proceed to proceed to begin. Can you guys see my screen? Hey, yes. can you see my screen? Yes. 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 Oh. Ah, okay, then that's that's fine. So this commercial. Now, before we begin, maybe someone can confirm to me. So last year they changed the syllabus, so the course outline for commercial transactions, and they removed certain topics. For instance, they did away with. Uh, with sale of goods, they did away with higher purchase and various other topics. I believe we are having the same syllabus. You guys are having the same syllabus as we did last year. True or false? True, true, true. 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 Ah, okay, then that's fine. So that means that in this entire paper, what we will be doing is question one. Because question one is insolvency, and then question two, which is on partnerships, and lastly three, we want to do three because three is on sale of goods. Four, higher purchase, we want to do four. Let's look at five. Five.
but okay we're doing five five is on I think five is on partnerships yeah llps okay five is on partnerships and then now lastly missy question six and question six so okay that's fine we'll begin so uh lavins alex noah please feel free to join in and i sent the question early in advance so i hope it's more of contributions and more of a discussion than lecturing because that way it sticks and then you open you're more open to understand if it's more of a discussion than a lecture and then also additionally you see papers are a bit complex last year when we did some of this revision with uh, some lectures some of them couldn't point out some certain things so i believe that there are some things i'll point out alex will point out lavins will point out Noah will point out but then you will have noticed some of the things that we have left out so feel free to uh to leave or to unmute because i can't see you just unmute and then go on straight ahead and and contribute whatever you want to contribute so we can begin save on time question one who will read it for us then now we begin analyzing the question kindly let's begin with question one just unmute because i can't see your hands or maybe lavins alex you guys can see so you can unmute and then you can pick anyone who's raised okay please go on please go on Focus Group Limited, a private company incorporated in Kenya under the Companies Act 2015, with its principal place of business in Nairobi, recently placed the following advertisement in the Mwananchi, a Mombasa-based local daily. Resolution of the shareholders of Focus Group Limited, whereas the shareholders of Focus Group Limited, here and after called the company, are desirous of winding up the company, it is resolved one, that the company be liquidated and dissolved, that any one or more of the directors of the company be and is hereby authorized to file all necessary documents in support of the voluntary liquidation of the company with the registrar of companies. Dated this 31st day of January 2018. Name of shareholder, Steve Rogers. Steve Rogers, name of shareholder, Scott Summers. Should I go on to part A? Yes, please go on. Okay. One of the directors of the company, Mr. Charles Xavier, seeks your advice in challenging the foregoing resolution. He informs you that as at 10 February 2018, the advertised resolution had not been lodged with the registrar of companies. He further states that resolution was not sanctioned by the board of directors, BOD, and that only two out of a possible five shareholders ratified the resolution. Finally, we are also advised that the resolution was published only once in the Mwananchi newspaper. Discuss any legal grounds for challenging the foregoing resolution. Then part B, Mr. Savior, was, Mr. Savior also informs you that on 29 January 2018, he and the other directors of the company met and made a declaration of solvency over the company's affairs. Advise him on the required docu content of the said declaration, along with any penalties or sanctions that could be imposed on the directors if the declaration were to lack reasonable grounds. I think that's it. Oh, there's a part C. Okay. Mr. Xavier is hopeful that the company will weather the threat of insolvency. Should this be the case, Mr. Xavier would like the company to go public in a bid to inject liquidity into the company. Identify and explain the documentation that would be required to convert the company from a private to a public company. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Sure, we can jump right into the question. So what do you guys think? What are some of the legal grounds for challenging this resolution? And remember, this question is five marks. So the danger or the tricky bit about giving only five points or just limiting yourself to a limited 
type of answers is based on the fact that I hear in commercial transactions, you may give an answer and then that answer only attracts half a mark. And I was told this by an examiner who marked our paper last year. So he said the best thing or the best strategy when answering this question is to be as as uh, you know broad as possible, uh, try and give all plausible answers because it hasn't limited you. It doesn't it, the question doesn't say discuss five legal grounds? It says discuss any legal ground. So you can start with the strongest points and then go down to some of the weak points that maybe you have. So, Asar, uh, please contribute. I'm sure you guys have started revising and you've done this paper. So what do you think? What's the problem with uh, this resolution? What are some of the grounds that you can challenge? This is the resolution does not have a 50 plus 1 majority. It's not a general resolution or a special resolution. Because if I'm not wrong, a, a special resolution needs a 75% majority and a general resolution needs a 50 plus 1. And in this resolution, neither has it reached that threshold. I'm Good. not wrong. That's That's very correct. So that's one. That's one, that's actually one point. This thing, you don't even need to think about whether it's general or, speci uh, or a special resolution. The reason is only how many? Two out of the five shareholders. So two out of five is neither 50 plus one nor 75%. So based on that, you have one point that this resolution was not validly passed because it didn't require. It didn't meet the requisite uh, majority. That's one. What? What else? What else? What else do you think? What's the problem? And remember what, what Alex said uh, a few minutes ago. He said that he usually puts statements, usually puts words inside the uh, questions for a specific reason. He usually puts statements for a specific reason. So um, try, try and identify what those reasons are. Another reason is. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, please go. Um, within 14 days of passing the resolution, um, the company is required to lodge a copy of that resolution with the registrar of companies. And I think they have not done that because he says that he informs you that on 10th February 2018, the advertised mm -hmm. resolution had not been lodged with the registrar of companies. Okay. Uh -huh. Please come come again. My my network. A bit tricky. Please come again. Uh, I'm saying that uh, under the Insolvency Act, it provides yes. that within 14 days Which of passing that resolution. Um, I cannot really pinpoint the provision, mm -hmm. but it's within 14. Oh, sorry. Um, under the Companies Act, under Section, I think, 25, if it is a resolution that is affecting the it's affecting the articles of the constitution of that company, then you're supposed to lodge a copy of the resolution with the registrar within 14 days of passing that resolution. That is under Section 25 of the Companies Act. Section 25 of the Companies Act. Okay, let's have a look at it. Registrar is to comply in case of failure with respect to a man. Now, in this circumstance, um, are the articles being amended? It's section 27. Section 20? 27 to. Sorry, let me see. 27 to. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. Section 27 to. G to be specific as a resolution for voluntary liquidation. So the timelines, the section applies. Let's read section 27 one. Within 14 days after a resolution or agreement to which a section is passed, 
the company shall lodge with the registrar for registration a copy of 14 days. That's a very good point. To be honest, I had not I had no clue about that specific provision in relation to that answer, and that's why I I really insist on. Uh, yeah, that's that's a very good observation. That's a very good observation. Now, there's another specific provision, specifically with with 14 days notice of a resolution to be published within 14 days after the resolution is published. I know this isn't under the Companies Act per se, but it's under the Insolvency Act. Let me just try and uh, open it. It's under the Insolvency Act. So that one, that provision on uh, on the Companies Act, that's a good one. It also falls under this. Now, the one that uh, well, my colleague here, one of the colleagues here just provided, if I'm not wrong, is section, uh, okay, I don't know how to remove this thing. Okay, it's, it's out. Uh, let's see, number eight. So this is a company's insolvency act. It's open section 394. So things to do with the uh, voluntary liquidation, they run from section 393 all the way to, I think it's section 390 actually. Let's just open it. 393. Yeah, yeah, from 393 to going downwards. So this entire question, if I'm not wrong, and Alex, Lavins, and Noah, feel free to interject in here. Here it is. They are testing this section 394. So from, from your, from, okay, I, I'd advise that you open section 394 from your own screens. And then now I go back to the question so that now we try and identify those mistakes with that resolution based on section 394 of the Insolvency Act. So let me just open the question here. But on your end, kindly open section 394. Then now we start identifying those mistakes one by one. So far we have two, 14 days. We have the one for special or general resolution. It doesn't meet any of the criteria. Those are two. Now let's try and identify others under or pass on to section 394 of the of the insolvency act. So who has seen any so far? Hello. Hello, go on. Um I I realized from the that that they posted the Resolution in a local daily, a Mombasa local daily, and the yes, um, the law says that it should be in a newspaper of nationwide circulation. So that is also a problem. Okay, now that's you. You've actually identified. That's very smart. You've identified it, but then you missed on it by a few, like just by an inch. You see, if you check section three ninety four. One subsection, uh, okay, 394.1b. What does it say? Within 14 days after a company has passed a resolution for its voluntary liquidation, it shall publish a notice setting out the resolution once in at least what? Two newspapers circulating in the area in which the company has its principal place of business. Now, this company has its principal place of business in Nairobi, but where did they advertise? In Mombasa. Are you know seeing those two small tricks that CLE comes out? And this is a question one, it's actually, this is a, this is a question. This is one, number one, this is question one. I, have you seen the trick? Have you seen the trick? 394 says that the circulation has to happen in the area of the company's principal place of business. And this company's principal place of business is in where? It's in Nairobi. But where did they advertise? In Monanchi, a Mombasa-based local daily. Yes, so there we have two other grounds in which you can challenge this, you can challenge this um, resolution. One, it was published in a place which is not the principal place of business. And the other one, it was not advertised in at least two newspapers. It was only advertised in one local daily. Sorry, local daily. So, so far we have four of them. 
So far, we have four grounds in which you can challenge these resolutions. Are you guys following? We have to yes. see there. Yeah? Yes. That's yes. four of them. No? So those are some of the tricks. So you remember what Alex and I emphasize what he said. So he usually puts statements inside a paper, and there is a reason for them putting that statement inside a paper, inside that question. So that's a trick that they wanted to see if uh, you know if these people are these people really grasped what the problem is. So that's four. We can see another mistake. Yes, yes. yes. Right, I, think I just want to confirm who is this person recording the meeting? Oh, it's okay. Who is the person recording the meeting? I'd like to know. Who's the person recording the meeting? We need to avoid. It's showing Omondi Yvonne. Sorry? It's showing Omondi Yvonne. That's the person that said it. Okay, so I hope she did start recording, you know, from the beginning because I, I, I we would like to avoid, you know, what we had last time. So if she didn't start recording from the beginning, then we wouldn't want to interrupt that. And I just hope the recording is in place for use after the class. Thank you. OK, I think that's that's fine. Thank you, Levins. Maybe uh, she can, she can, she can. Uh, we've noted who it is. So if there's any problem with the recording, we we'll, can just ask her to maybe retrieve it for us and, and so forth. But in the meantime, we could maybe say chat her or something. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Now, now, so we have four points right now. We need to look for the for the last one. Who 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 can see anything? Who can see anything? And it's actually something that's really hidden. Uh, uh, yes. I don't know. Uh, which? Uh, from the same section, section 94. Uh-huh. Uh, which, uh, also, in addition to the new, uh, to the two newspapers, mm -hmm. the same resolution should be published once in the in the Kenya Gazette. Yeah. Yes. That's that's another one. Yes. Five. And also on the yes, company. Build up to another one. Uh -huh. On the company's website, if any, yeah, those are some things that you will you note in that particular place. Yes, another one. Now, other than now, move away from section three ninety four. Which one else? What else can you see here? A long card. I don't can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I'm thinking. Uh, they're saying that this. Uh, kindly just go back to the question. Okay, the resolution sorry. is not sanctioned by the board of directors. If you look at section 398 of the Insolvency Act, it says uh -huh. that the directors may, during the meeting, make a statutory declaration for the uh, to the effect of you know this liquidation. So if that was not done, then I think it's against section 398. Mm -hmm. Now the statutory declaration, the statutory declaration of also known as a uh, um, uh, what it's a declaration of uh, solvency. Mm -hmm. Let's look at it. Um, okay, let me think. Let me put a star on that as I think about it, and then now I'll get back to you before we move on to the next question. Let me just put a star on that as I try and contemplate and think about it on the statutory declaration and its and its effect and purpose. So we started if this. I, yeah, sorry. If I may. Yeah, yeah please go on. Um, the statutory declaration. Mm -hmm is prepared by the directors 
and it can be prepared either five weeks preceding the date on which that resolution is passed mm -hmm. or on the day on which the resolution is passed, but before. And the but purpose before. of this statutory, yeah. So mm -hmm. when you are loading your documents with the registrar, uh, if you look under the 2018 mm -hmm. regulations, one of those documents is that statutory mm -hmm. declaration. And it's basically stating that the directors have made an inquiry into the company and that the company will mm -hmm. be able to pay its debts within uh, a stated period, not being longer than 12 months. So that's the purpose of the statutory declaration. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I just um, and uh, yeah. uh -huh. go on. And uh, something else mm -hmm. is that uh, that um, okay. So another point. Yes. Sorry. Let me let me let me think about it and then get back to you. Sorry. Tell us our no problem. Now. As you think about it, and also say contemplate about the statutory declaration of solvency under Section 398, along this line, here, here it is. Number two, is there a problem with number two? You may ask. I won't even sure, but I'm just asking. Is there a problem with number two? Is there a problem if anyone, anyone could uh, just uh, note? Now, we'll have to read it within, uh, in lieu of section 77A of the companies, or the companies of insolvency regulations, which says that when making an application for voluntary liquidation, the liquidator shall also lodge the following documents with the registrar of companies. So the issue is, who is the one who is mandated to lodge this documentation? Is it the directors of the company or is it the liquidator? What do you think? I think it's the liquidator. Yeah, and you see uh, the process of uh, liquidation. You know, once a liquidator is appointed, the director sees acting. The functions of a director sees. So that's another issue that will arise with this resolution. Section 77, not section, but regulate or rule 77 of A of the insolvency regulations. So those are some of the strongest points that I identified. Now I know. And we can each um, we can each gain from from you know from diversity. So I will maybe invite uh, Alex in. As I, uh, do you see anything, or do you note anything here that's peculiar that can you know, but that we can add on to this? Other uh, than the six or so I think we've mentioned around six or seven that could maybe add on it, or maybe anything that you want to note or any advice that you want to give, Alex, Lavin, Snow, kindly. Yes. I, I remember when you were yes, here, we actually discussed this question. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you, and, and uh, this is one of those questions which I was saying that CLE does not waste any words, not even sentences, words. When yes. you see any word in, a, in an exam, and I say the exam just there for a reason. And I remember we we pointed out that issue of Mombasa and Nairobi. I was waiting for someone to point out, which I think was very smart. Because yeah, when you look at the, where the, the, the repartment was placed, it was placed in Mombasa and then the business operates in Nairobi. Just a simple simple thing. It can deny you can move from 49 to 50. So reiterates the point that just be careful. Uh, look at each word by itself, ask yourself why is it that this word is in this question. And when you, you have an edge as compared to a person who just read the question generally. Thanks. Bah, thank you so much. Noah, Lavins.
from question 1a is there anything else that you'd want to add or any peculiar issues in order to use that resolution maybe as I get back. So I think we've covered the major ones. We've covered the major ones. One, it doesn't specify or it doesn't show, okay, it was passed invalidly. We didn't have the requisite majority, either by a simple majority or the 75% majority. That's one. The second one that we pointed out was on the issue of advertisement. So it's not advertised, it was advertised in the wrong place. And then it wasn't advertised in at least three newspapers, and it was it wasn't also put in the in the the gazette. Now the other one that we noted is one or more directors with the liquidator who has the function or the powers to lodge these documents, and the supporting uh, section for that is Regulation 77A of the Insolvency Regulations. The other one that maybe you could add on it, it's not here, but you can find it in the Companies Act. I'll get the section for you. Would be section. Um, Would be section. Um, I'll get the section. I don't have it here with me right now. But the issue to do with resolutions. So when you read about resolutions, there's a requirement that you need to specify the kind of resolution. Yeah. So if it's, you know here it's, it's just written as resolution, so you need to specify you know special or ordinary and uh, so forth. And then there are also those that have been mentioned. So if you check section three ninety four together with the section 27 that was pointed out and it was very smart and that's something that I've learned today to do with the 14 days. Yeah? So you have to lodge this thing within 14 days of the making of the resolution. So and I and I see that first day of January 2018 it informs you that as at 10th February the advertisement had not, had not been lodged so the 14 days time limit hasn't been strictly adhered to and then there's that other one of uh, declaration of solvency that has been mentioned by two of my colleagues over here which will also fall under that place so you can see other than the five you know other than five points we have more than six or seven strong valid points which will help us uh, gain marks and I think unless there are any questions we've covered in depth but uh, 1A. Now, I remember you said that I'll get back to the statutory declaration of solvency. And the reason I haven't done it is because part B is on that issue, if I'm not wrong. So, is there any question before we move on forward from section or from question 1A? Uh, so yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering. Um, you used section 394, uh, but uh, these guys are talking about, you know, the advertised resolution, not the notice, not the advertisement itself. The advertised resolution had not been lodged with the registrar. So I think we have to focus on the resolution itself being lodged. And to that extent, I think uh, the proper section would be section 398, and that would be section 398.3 that says within 14 days after the date on which the list for liquidation is passed, the company shall lodge a copy of the declaration uh, with uh, you know, the registrar for registration. So I, I am of the belief that this one talks more about the, you know, uh, the resolution for liquidation and not mm -hmm. the advertisement. 394 talks about the advertisement. Then I have another question. Uh, this uh, resolution was passed, or it is dated, 31st day of January 2018. Mm -hmm. They're telling us that by 10th February 2018, it had mm -hmm. not, you know, been uh, been lodged. Yes. Uh, yeah. And now this section, uh, 398.3, talks about 14 days. I believe from 31st day of January to 10th February, 14 days have not elapsed. So I think these guys still have, you know, four more days to lodge this because it's within those days and not after those days. So don't you think we'll be wrong to talk about this section and say that it has not been complied with yet there's still more time to comply with it? Hi, now, thank you for that. Now let's go back to the first uh, question on the issue of the advertised. Now the reason why I was going to section 394, you need to check section 394. 394, the short title for the section is notice 
of resolution to liquidate. Yeah. And if you read section 394.1, what does it say? Within 14 days after a company has passed a resolution for its voluntary liquidation. Now, let's read the question. The question here is saying, Focus Group Limited placed the following advertisement, an advertisement which is basically just a notice in a Mombasa-based local daily. What does that advertisement say? Resolution of the shareholders of Focus Group Limited, meaning this resolution was already done. So what they're just doing is they're just notifying people of you know, the resolution that was already pla placed or a resolution that was already passed by the company. Up to there. Are we? Are we okay up to them? Yeah. yeah. Now, has that clarified the first bit of the question? Ah, uh, yeah. It's clarified, yes? Yeah. So, yeah. in fact, this, uh, this resolution was already passed, yeah? And that's why you're seeing here there's a shareholder, Steve Rogers, Scott Summers. These two people in purportedly passed a resolution. Two out of five people purportedly passed a resolution to, to do what? To liquidate a company. Yeah, and then now they're giving the notice under this advertisement. So you've gotten up to there why section 394 comes into play. Because in essence, yeah, what yeah. this is, this is a notice of resolution to liquidate. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Higher. That's fine. So under this notice of resolution to liquidate, we've pointed out all the mistakes that were there and so forth. And so forth. Now, this 398, this 398, this 398 in a letter, it's bringing in uh, so many. And actually, it's actually valid because even last year we had these arguments. 398 in essence is talking about a declaration of solvency. When they talk about uh, the when they talk about uh, statutory declaration, they're talking about a declaration of solvency. And what they're saying is, if you check three ninety eight three, they're not talking about a resolution. They're not talking about anything to do with this resolution. They're just saying, within fourteen days after the date on which the resolution has been passed, the company has to lodge a copy of this declaration. What is this declaration? A declaration of solvency. Now, in essence, what a declaration of solvency is, it's just a statement. It's just a statutory declaration saying that the directors looked into the affairs of the company. And after looking into the affairs of the company, they are advised or they, have, they are of the opinion that the company will not be able to pay its debts in full, that will, will be able to pay its debts in full, sorry, will be able to pay its debts in full together with any interest. So that's what the declaration of solvency is. They're just saying, you know, uh, we, okay, it's a statutory declaration, just like, okay, it's different from an affidavit, but you know, we, blah, 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 directors of this. And I'll show you a sample. I think it's one, one of these forms. It's, it's actually in one of these forms. I'll show you a sample of a statutory, uh, uh, statutory declaration of solvency. Let's say we've looked into the affairs of this company. After looking into the affairs of this company, we are fully satisfied that this company is able to pay its debts within 12 months. So that's what 390. So 398 won't come into place when you're talking about section 1A, because that's not the that's that's not the provision governing governing it in essence. The provision governing 1A or anything to do with 1A is section 394. Now they're saying within 14 days, and this is backed up by section 77A. So what 77A is saying, after making an application for voluntary liquidation of a company, the liquidator shall also lodge the following documents to the registrar. This is the resolution. This is the statutory declaration, statement of financial position. So these are all the documentation that you will need to lodge with the registrar of companies after you guys have passed a resolution to the effect that you want to liquidate. Now let's look at this thing from that to be. Let's see from that to be. Let's just start call part A and uh, part B. It's time. Let me just need form that it will be
You can trace the first schedule. It's like my. Maybe I will bend it or I skipped it. It's a creditor's petition application to set aside. Number 11, form number 15, 17, form number 18. Form number 17. It is of intention from that true. Ah, yeah. So this is a statement of company's financial position. Let's see if we can see the definition of solvency over here. Uh -huh. Somebody kindly help me trace it. Oh yeah, I've lost it. Ah, I found it from the BRS website. Let me see. Here it is, sorry. So can you see this? This is what section 3 anything to do with section 398. This is what they are talking about. A statutory declaration of uh, solvency. Can you see it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this is a statutory declaration of solvency. What they're saying is after what the 98.3, which was a uh, pointed out just a few minutes ago, is saying is that you know these guys have looked into the affairs of the company and they have they are of the opinion that the company will be able to pay its debts. It's as simple as that within a period of 12 months from the commencement of winding up. It's just a, it's a pretty straightforward thing. It's as simple as that. And what 398 says, this thing is a bit, it is 398. Let me open Okay, so what 393 is saying is that after 14 days after you've passed uh, the resolution to liquidate, you need to lodge this declaration with the registrar for registration. So this declaration is also one of those documents that you need to register or to lodge to the registrar for registration. So it's it, it's, 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 it has nothing to do with uh, the resolution that was passed in the first place or the notice of intention to liquidate that was passed in the first place. So Bearing that in mind, I think we'll move first uh, under part B, because I think under part A we are, uh, and let's know the questions. Are there any more questions with regards to part A? Because actually we think we've tackled A and B. Because B is just saying, what are the contents of a say declaration of solvency, and what are the penalties that could be imposed on the directors if the declaration, if the declaration uh, were to lack reasonable grounds? So it's pretty, it's actually pretty straightforward. So it's here under section 398.4. A director who makes a declaration without having reasonable grounds, what is the penalty? The penalty is that you will be liable to a conviction. Okay, on, conv on conviction, you will be liable to a fine not exceeding 2 million shillings or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding five years. So th these are the penalties. Hmm? These are the penalties. Now, what are the contents of the declaration of solvency? So it's just a matter of just 
picking these things here. Yeah? So what are the contents? The first one, the detector. Sorry. Yes. Uh, it's Kelvin. Uh, just a question. Yes. Yes. Go. On. Hey, the shareholders have signed against their names. Where in uh, or in the uh, question paper or should they sign so that it can become a valid resolution? Yeah, sorry, where? Oh, in this in this uh in oh, part one after A. Their name. Yes, after their name. Shouldn't they also oh, sign after their name? Okay, yes. Yeah. Yeah, you add it there. So far we had, I mean, we had like six, seven points. Add that one there also. There's no, there's no harm in starting with the strong points, finishing with the rest. That's that's good. I hadn't even pointed that. Thank you for that. Now back to here. So the contents, we are on the contents of the statutory declaration. So what I was saying is it's a simple thing. When you're told to set the contents, it's just as simple as that. Uh, yes? Uh, I'm sorry. To yes. Right, okay. Um, so I, I just have a question. I'm looking at section 381, and I'm wondering, I, I mean 382, and I'm wondering what kind of obligation this is, because I'm seeing if there is no statutory declaration, then it was a creditors. OK, what kind of declaration with this sorry, a simple question because I feel so like say section 383. Because in this question there was no credit as statutory declaration. And then when mm -hmm. I when I look at section, I think it's three three oh man. No, it's okay, it's okay. Just relax, relax and then go on. When I look at section three ninety-three. It's 393, not 383, yes? No, I, I looked at 383 at the at the different ways of liquidating a company. Then I look at 393 and I see before okay. passing a resolution for voluntary liquidation, the company mm -hmm. is supposed to give notice to any qualifying floating charge, a, a holder of a, any qualifying floating charge. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just give me a minute to, I think you can proceed and then I'll, I'll raise my issues later because I'm feeling a bit mixed up. No, it's okay. It's okay. No problem. No problem. Actually, even now, it's okay. It's fine. Just, just, and then now you'll get back to us. So, uh, on B, the question B is just asking you to give the parts of a statutory declaration of solvency. So, it's a matter, it's a simple matter of just been pointing what's here. One, that uh, you watch, uh, it's, there's a solemn oath. Uh, we need to give the details of the directors. That's one. You need to give the details of the company. That's another content or part of the statutory declaration of solvency. You need to indicate that you've made a full inquiry into the affairs of a company. There also needs to be a statement saying that after making that full inquiry, you are of the opinion that the company will be able to pay its debts. And then you also need to attach the statement of, the statement of the company's assets and liabilities, basically a statement of financial position. And then uh, you swear, you swear, okay, you declare, it's a statutory declaration, so you declare. And then after the declaration, the, the name of the director and the signature of the director, the name of the direction, the signature of the director. And then also you need to put in the, what? There's a place for witnessing. An advocate has to witness before me. So, and with that, you have your full marks with uh, regards to question uh, B. You have your full marks. You've listed all the parts, all the contents of the declaration, and then you've also gone ahead and you've given the penalty. So what is the penalty under Section 398? Upon conviction, you will be liable to a term not exceeding five years and uh, some cash money, which is uh, how much? And some cash money, which is um, two million. Two million and imprisonment for a term not exceeding five years. I think for part A and B, we've covered sufficiently, unless there are questions. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Lavins, Alex, anybody, uh, please interject and uh, contribute on anything you need, on anything you deem worthy to contribute on. Uh, 
Tolongka. Uh, may adib mo? Yes, go on. Okay, I guess why, maybe I've been having network problem, but I had something to add on the issue of uh, uh, section 398. Uh, just as a general knowledge, uh, whenever you realize that uh, all the directors, uh, during their, um, the director's meeting, uh, when they are making the statutory declaration and they realize that uh, they are not able to pay their debts within 12 months, that is the essence of the uh, uh, declaration of solvency. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, what happens next is that uh, the next stage, if they realize that uh, they won't be able to pay their debts, then what uh, what will go next is now liquidation by the creditors. Remember, this is now by members, but uh, when you realize that uh, you are not able to pay your debt within 12 months and you're making that declaration of solvency, then now it will be uh, liquidation by the creditor. That's what I wanted to add. And that's because Shai I've been having network problems. Sorry, uh, sorry, I was doing something else. So thank you so much for that, No, Thank you for that clarification on the 12 months period and the creditors uh, and so forth. So any, qu any other question or contribution on A and B? Um, uh, I disagree with uh, no There's someone with a mic. Yes, on that position, I disagree with Noah. Sorry, I can't show you it's bad. Can you hear me now? Which uh, which position? Sorry. Come. I disagree with uh, Noah on the next option. I can hear now. I think there's a delay uh, between us, so um, I'll just proceed. Um, I disagree with Noah on the next option being creditors voluntary because now it has to be initiated by creditors. But if it's still members who are willing to do this and they, they, they can't convince creditors, then the next option for them, wouldn't it be to petition now the court for, to have compulsory liquidation by the court? Isn't that a more readily available option after a member's voluntary fails on account of the company being insolvent? I'm back again. So that was addressed to now. I'm sorry, I'll, by the time I was shifting from my desk to another area, I didn't get, I didn't quite get clearly uh, what was being said. But is it on what's what's the condition? What's the condition? Mm -hmm. If I may, um, Noah has uh, proposed that the next available option Yes, please go on. Please go on. I can't I can't hear you. I think I think I've been I was muted. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yes, go on. Yes, uh, Mr. Noah was proposing that mm -hmm. the next available option, if a member's voluntary uh, feels because of uh, directors having realized that the company is insolvent, would be mm -hmm. the creditors voluntary. But that mm -hmm. supposes that the creditors will agree with the members of the company should be dissolved. So my proposal, uh, 
or maybe my question will be, uh, will not the next better option be a petition by the members to court for a compulsory liquidation? Isn't that more readily available to them? Oh, okay, 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 now I get it. Now you see, um, when you talk about liquidation, it can happen in three main ways. There is members voluntary liquidation, there's creditors voluntary liquidation, and then there's liquidation uh, by the court. Now, when you talk about members voluntary liquidation, how is it began? It's began under section, uh, you can start reading from section 383 of the Insolvency Act. That's where the entire process starts. Yep. And uh, in a GF, it's when a special resolution is passed, notice of the resolution, what we just went through, blah, 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 and so forth till uh, the process begins. Now, you need to note, under section 398, there is uh, this thing, there is uh, the making and effect of a declaration of solvency. So it's one of the documents that's required to be filed by, by, by the liquidator when a liquidation is undergoing. What I think Noah was saying is that, in essence, it begins as a member's voluntary liquidation, and then it becomes a creditor's voluntary liquidation if the directors of the company fail to file that declaration of solvency or fail to meet the requirements under Section 390, which is properly valid, and what actually happens in practice. Yeah, because afterwards, what will happen? The company, I think it's, let me see if it's section what? Section four. But okay, but the meeting of creditors will be convened by the company after 14 days, at which a voluntary liquidation is. Uh, Uh, voluntary liquidation has been proposed 14 days if the declaration of solvency i think i am not wrong if i'm not sure i, I think that's what that's what noah was kind of saying which is totally valid because that's, that's how it will move from being a member's voluntary liquidation to being um this other one to being um a creditor's voluntary liquidation Uh, yes. Um. So, yes. Yes. So, so I'm back. Uh, I, uh -huh. had, I had a question earlier. Kindly, Kidogo. To is it the same one who was? I no. Think it's a is different it this, one. It's a different one. No, maybe back to the to the, and then now we'll come back to you. So that at least to settle all the issues. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are, are, we, are, we, are we on the same page on that? On the issue of members voluntary liquidation and the creditors voluntary liquidation and how it comes? Yes, we are. I haven't heard as much of that. That's one of the circumstances in which it turns from being a members to uh to uh to a creditors voluntary. So if, if directors fail to to lodge the declaration of solvency, what's the effect? And the declaration of solvency is just saying that the company will be able to pay its debts. Yes? Now, if the company is unable to pay its debts, what will they do? They will need to organize a meeting within the next 14 days, and that meeting will be a creditor's meeting. Now, the creditor's meeting, now that's where now it, uh, it, it now becomes or turns to become a creditor's voluntary liquidation. I'll send you some other materials on that, so don't 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 worry, don't worry. And then liquidation by the court. This is where now the court and uh, you know which court has uh, the jurisdiction to this. Which court has the jurisdiction? It's usually a tricky spot, but only the high court has the jurisdiction to this effect. And this is where, and this is where now the court comes into place to to you know. To, to, to enforce or to enhance the liquidation by the court. So it's also a special resolution where it is passed to give effect to the liquidation by the court. So when it comes to liquidation, it happens in three ways. Members voluntary liquidation, creditors voluntary liquidation, and there's also liquidation by the court. 
So you know what will happen, there are certain documentation. So it's, in a sense, if you want to really, really understand uh, insolvency, which is not, it's a bit broad, but it's, it's a fairly easy unit to read. All you need to do is come to, okay, I don't know why this thing is, I'm projecting my screen. I need to remove this thing, okay. Uh, to, yes? Uh, just to assist my the, the student, uh, I'd like to refer her to section 404 of the Insolvency Act. Uh, okay. Those are one of it's one of the circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, here's I was actually looking for it, but it was a bit uh, lost. But here it is conversion to creditors voluntary liquidation. So yeah, here it is. Section 400. Thank you so much, Mal, for that. So these were, if a declaration of solvency has not been made or has failed, then it turns out to become a creditor's voluntary liquidation. So up to there, we are, we are, we're fine, yes? Mm -hmm. So, so long. Yes. May I, may I now ask my question? Ah, yes. Sorry. Yeah, you can ask your question now. Sorry, but I hope you've answered uh, adequately, Charity. You've been answered adequately mm -hmm. on that bit. Yes, I have. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And now we can go to uh, Caroline. Please go on. So I'm looking at section 393.2, and I'm wondering whether this would qualify as an answer to the question. It says, before passing a resolution for voluntary liquidation, the company shall give notice of the resolution to the holder of any qualifying floating charge in respect of the company's property. So in this question, and I think as you said earlier, a resolution has already been passed and a notice has been issued in one of the newspapers. Dailies. So, mm -hmm. yeah, in one of the dailies. So my question is, should, would I be stretching the question if there is no evidence of any notice that was previously given to any qualifying floating charge in respect of the company's property? Mm -hmm. So 393.2, before passing a resolution for voluntary liquidation, the company shall give notice of the resolution to the holder of any qualifying. Okay. That's actually a valid, uh, it's a valid point. So I'll say, uh, just go back to okay, the question. The question hasn't fully indicated it, but at the same time, what I said uh, initially with regards to the last bit of the question it says discuss any legal ground so if i were you and that's a very smart way and it's a very smart uh way of thinking about it i will put it i will start with the strongest the most obvious ones you know the examiner they're the most they are some of the most obvious uh, uh obvious answers so start with the obvious ones then now stream down to all those and you can also mention section 393 too it may be stretching it but at the same time there's no harm in doing it and may show the examiner that you know so you know if you cite section 393 to and say that you know you need to notify holders of qualifying floating charges which is basically saying that before you pass a volume uh before you pass a resolution to voluntarily liquidate you need to notify who you need to notify creditors so yes, I'd put that one in. It's perfectly valid and uh, perfectly in order. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, but to what I was saying is, if you read these insolvency regulations, these regulations have the step-by-step -step processes for everything. Starting with, you've, okay, we've done insolvency. This is what we've done right now is insolvency. But bankruptcy may arise. So you may need to know how to institute a bank uh, bankruptcy you know petition there's uh, the debtors application well there's the creditors application there's also the 
models, data application, creators application. Then other than that, there are things to do with alternatives to bankruptcy. You know, there are no asset procedure. Um, what's the other thing? Voluntary arrangements. And what's the other one? There are usually three. Um, forgetting one. But all those processes are found under this act, under this regulation. And it's not broad. So you could start with this. You could read this and then pair it up with the, the Insolvency Act. It's th This act has so many sections, but for exam purposes, you will need to grasp maybe 10, 15, or maybe 20 sections, which is not hard and which is manageable. So hopefully we'll find another question touching on the same topic and then we'll cover it in broad. Uh, we'll cover it broadly. Then now we go to so we are okay from A, B. We're okay with regards to question A and B. We can move on to question C. A and B were fine, yes? You've understood what the resolution is. You've understood what a declaration of solvency is. You've seen what a declaration of solvency looks like. We've actually even gone over and aboard to look at instances where a creator's voluntary application, uh, voluntary liquidation arises under section 404, which now pointed out. So let's move to C. So C is basically saying Mr. Xavier is hopeful that the company will weather the threat of insolvency and they need to inject liquidity into the company. And the question is saying, identify and explain the documentation that will be required to convert the company from a private company to a public company. Where do you begin with this question? How will you begin answering this question in the first place? It has a lot of stories, but what they're just saying is, how do you convert a public company to a private company? Yes, somebody who will be on BO2 so that we move forward. Hopefully, we'll manage to clear this paper. How do you how do you convert a company from a private company to a public company? Under the companies. Oh, and then sorry, I forgot something else. Declaration of solvencies is found under the under what? Under the um, Insolvency Act. And there's also a provision in the Companies Act. Let me see if I can see it. It's just it's somewhere here. You will, maybe at your own time you can go trace it and then, but it's It's somewhere there in the Companies Act. So, but we've moved away from that. We already have the Section 398, but there's also a certain provision and declaration of solvency under the Companies Act. So let's go to how do you convert? How do you, what's the process of converting a private company to a public company? So Langa, is there a child? Yes, please go on. Um, I think mostly we are asking about yeah. the documentation, and uh, mm -hmm. I don't know whether we'll be getting the exact section. I think section 70, uh, 74 2 of Companies Act. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first thing you need to file is a statement of the company's new name, uh, the name that you have chosen after mm -hmm. you've converted the company, mm -hmm. and if the company did not have a secretary, you need to provide a statement containing uh, the particulars of the proposed secretary. <laughs> you also need to have a copy of the special resolution authorizing the company to convert, which will be launched mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. And a company, um, what else? A copy of the company's articles, uh, the mm -hmm. articles of association, mm -hmm. which have been amended. Mm -hmm. Uh, a copy of balance sheets. Mm -hmm. um, mm, and a copy of um, an independent valuation report, I think. Okay, thank you for that. That's 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 the answer. Nothing to add, nothing to deduct. And that's the answer. So the question is basically just saying what are the documentation that you will require to convert the company from a public private to a public company? So if you brought such a question, it's six marks. Other than the documentation, so show the examiner that you know. Remember this question one. See that you've answered question one very well. The perception that you form in the mind of the examiner is that you know your stuff, 
you know you are you know the law and even when they go on to mark the other questions it's just going to be a free fall you're going to be awarded marks so as i say and as i usually reiterate giving sections is really an important part in a in a legal exam question that i appreciate that you gave you gave the statutory uh, the statutory provision which is, which is section 70 uh, which is section Section 74 to Section 74, there is also 74 yeah, Section 74 to Okay. Solomka. So yes, 74. Uh -huh. Solomka. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Perhaps before you proceed, you do have been silly. Yes, I can hear it. It's gone. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you all. Yes. Great. Like I was saying, CLE is quite some weird character. So perhaps next time what they will ask you, what are just some of the conditions that needs to be satisfied before a private limited company or a private and limited company could be converted into a public company. So don't just limit yourself to how the documents need for you to convert a private company to a public company. Sometimes they will ask you what are the conditions that need now to be fulfilled. For example, the company itself must have a share capital. Um, the requirements as to the share capital itself are satisfied. And then the requirements also regarding its net asset is also satisfied. But even if the other perhaps condition could be, you know, if this section on uh, allotment of shares for non-cash consideration applies, that the requirements have been satisfied. So that one is under, I think, section 73 of the Companies Act. And then the condition could be the company itself has not even previously been converted, has not previously been converted into an uh, unlimited company. So try to think beyond the four walls, what lies ahead, right? So that's how people pass exams, because you just don't focus on the question itself as we are reversing right now onto the documentation, but at your own free time and at your own convenience, you try to understand what exactly constitutes the conditions and perhaps what type of a resolution needs to be passed, in what form, you understand? Yeah, so that's that's exactly what um, I needed to put across. Back to you, so long. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you for that, Lavins. Thank you for that, Lavins. So yes, so when revising, go over and about, over, and uh, read, just read broadly and widely. And then, uh, but they have to search questions in conversion. When, you, when they bring about a question on conversion, don't leave out section 69. 69 is the blanket, you can see the blanket section. So this is just a hack for your exams. Whenever you see any question being brought to do with the conversion of companies, talk about section 69. Because 69 is the section that states, you know, you can convert a private company to a public company, public company to a private company and uh, so forth. So begin with section 69, go on, mention section, uh, the section 70, the conditions that have been put with Lavins and then the one that have been answered by our colleagues with regards to the, to the documentation under section 74. And uh, you're good to go, you're home, you're home. Right? So, in essence, when you talk about conversion, think about one, a resolution has to be passed. Which kind of resolution? A special resolution. Think about articles need to be amended. Remember, uh, is it 8, 9, 10, when they're talking about, when they're defining public companies and when they're defining private companies and when they're defining all those uh, companies, there are certain limitations. For instance, a public, a private company has a limitation with regards to the number of members, it has a limitation to um, uh, what else? The, the, there are those limitations under up there. So, for those limitations to be removed, there needs to be certain amendments to the article. So, amended article has to be there. Then, remember something else to do with the uh, uh, private companies don't require you to have uh, a company secretary, so you need to have a proposed. Uh, proposed a company secretary when you want to convert and then the new name the statement of the new name that has been rightly put pointed out and all those documentation that have been pointed out by by, by both my colleagues and i think under question one we are through 
with question one and we've sufficiently answered question one, giving the law, giving the facts and giving the analysis. I think we are good under question one. So out of five marks, one A, you can say you can easily get four, just to be realistic and get four. Under question B, you can get at least, out of nine, you can get at least seven. It's fairly easy, seven, eight. And then the last one, six, you can get at least five marks. That's how commercial is. Just go straight to the point, mention the section, give the facts, give the analysis. No stories, and you're done. Is there or does anyone have a question with regards to question one? Any question, contribution, it's welcome. Do we move forward to question two? Is it fine if we go to number two? Yes. So, yes. Now, okay. So somebody please read question two. Uh, in general, <laughs> Daniel and Richard formed and operated a business named Wanda Enterprises. At the very onset, the three business owners entered into an agreement in the following terms. The first one, that the initial capital contribution would be a total of 60000 with Wallace contributing that 6%, Daniel 30%, and Richard 34 thereof. The additional capital contributions or withdrawals may be made to or from the capital of business by unanimous consent of all business owners. That profit would be shared in the same proportion of capital contribution. Over the course of the next three years, Wallace and Daniel made additional capital contribution, while Richard withdrew a portion of his initial capital contribution. Further, Wallace left in the business account some 12,000 shillings which was rightfully payable to him by way of, of profit contribution. By the end of the year 2017, the business owner's net cash contributions after taking full account of the initial capital contributions, additional capital contribution, withdrawals, payments made by the business owners to or on behalf of the business and profit distribution not yet drawn were as follows. Wallace had 170,000, Daniel 127,500, and Richard 42,500. By unanimous consent in January 2018, the three business owners decided to dissolve the business. There were no liabilities owed to external creditors. The winding up activities were therefore limited to refund of capital and distribution of surplus assets, if any. A. Identify the nature of the business between Wallace, Daniel, and Richard. If Richard insisted that he was entitled to receive 34% of the capital and any surplus assets, would he have correctly calculated his, his proportion of capital and surplus assets, analyze and explain fully? B, if Wallace claimed interest payment on the uncollected profit distribution calculated at the rate of 3% per annum, would he be entitled to payment thereof, analyze and explain fully? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Now, let's jump straight to the question. So this is on partnerships. So, uh, when you're reading for commercial, there's some things you need to note. It's hard. OK, a question on companies may fail to come, but it's hard for you to the probabilities are low. So there are some areas that you need to really, really, you need to really focus on. One of it is companies. The other one is on partnerships. It's, I have, I've not come across a paper where they failed to test at least something on partnership. So it's it's good to read on partnerships. So how do you read on partnerships? Open two acts. Open the Partnerships Act 2012. <clears throat> partnerships Act 2012. Open this act. Partnerships Act and uh, the LLP Act. 
Limited Liability Partnerships Act, LLP Act. So under the Partnerships Act, number 16, just, it's something that don't, it won't take you a lot of time. Just go through the main sections, just read the entire act, analyze the sections, write section eight, what does section eight talk about? What does section 10 talk about? In brief, in one or two lines, analyze the entire act, analyze the LLP Act, and you'll have broadly and um, adequately covered everything to do with partnerships. So that's how you read for partnerships. Now we go to the question. The first question is identify the nature of business between Wallace, Daniel and Richard. What's the nature of business between Wallace, Daniel and Richard? How would you approach that question? It's three marks. How would you go about it? How would you go about it? Somebody contribute, please. Well, they entered into an argument. Because they entered into an argument. Mm -hmm. How will you answer? Uh, identify the nature of the business. What's the answer to that? And then go on, please. So long, Cass. Mm -hmm. I will yes. first identify the nature of the business, which yes, is of course a partnership, and then I will I will go mm -hmm. ahead to state the characteristics of of a partnership. Uh huh. Go on. Uh huh. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. Please state the characteristics of a partnership. Is it sufficient to just say that the problem that you have three types of partnerships? You have general partnership, partnership. So I think we ought to clarify which kind of partnership this was. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Go on. Please clarify what kind of partnership is it? Um. Hmm. It cannot be a limited partnership because uh, we know that a limited partnership we need to have. Is it one manager and another one? I can't remember. One general partner mm -hmm. and the rest. So I'm torn between an LLP and a mm -hmm. general partnership. But I have a feeling because now they've had shares, it is a LLP. Um, okay, okay, interesting, interesting. Mm -hmm. i get back to that. Okay, I'll get back to that. I'm not really down. Put us down. Okay, uh -huh. <coughs> and there was one who mentioned the characteristics, the characteristics of a partnership. What, what are the characteristics of a partnership? Then now we go back to circle on the issue of LLP, GP, and the LPs. Limited liability. Mm, yeah, now uh, somebody. Mm. Okay, so. Now, somebody said that we need to distinguish between the three types of partnerships. What do you think? What are the three types of partnerships? Okay, we have the three types of partnerships. Now, which partnership is this? Based on the question, not who will guide you to either one being a limited partnership or either one being a limited liability partnership or it being a general partnership. The, I, I, I think what would guide us is the fact that uh, they are contributors. So in case of... Come again. Uh, I think what would guide us is the initial capital contribution. Okay. 
because in case they oh, I'm not very sure about this. Okay, but that's fine. Yeah. That's right. Hmm? Okay. To, to me, mm -hmm. I would say that uh, perhaps this is a general partnership, and what might guide me mm -hmm. that uh, if you look at C, one of the characteristics mm -hmm. is that the profit will be shared in the same proportion of capital contribution. Mm -hmm. So to me, it seems like a general partnership. Yes, okay. That's fine. That's that's correct. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, let's go to the answer. I was given this question before even going into describing or analyzing and just stating GP, GP, LP, LLP, or so forth. I'll begin with most basic thing that you could do, and is you just come to section two of the partnerships act. Or how does it define a partnership? It means the relationship which exists between persons who carry on business in common with a view to making profits. Now let's go back to the facts. I will say that this the nature of this business is a partnership. Why? Under section two of the Partnerships Act, a partnership is defined as two as persons coming together with a view of what? Making profits. So here. Wallace, Daniel, and Richard formed and operated a business, and they talked about uh, profits. That profits will be shared in the same proportion of capital contribution. So, what have I done there? I've answered the nature of the business. I haven't gone into the specifics of the GP or LLP or LP yet, but I've answered. Uh, I've answered. Uh, I've answered. Um, I've answered. That it's a partnership under section three of the under section section two let's see section two of the partnerships act sorry i've given a definition and uh, i've given a legal definition under section two of the partnerships act i've merged the fact to the law talking about the issue of profit and the fact that the question provides and the fact that the uh, uh, the, the facts provide that you know these people wanted to do what to distribute profits in how capital was contributed and then lastly um yeah that's it but now since you've mentioned the issues to do with gp lps and llps let's first distinguish between the three and how you identify that this is a limited liability partnership or this is a limited partnership or this is a or this is a general partnership so a general partnership in simple terms is where all the partners have unlimited liability. That's a general partnership. All the partners have unlimited liability. A limited liability partnership is where all the partners have limited liability. So we've distinguished two general partners, all partners have unlimited liability. Limited liability partnerships, all partners have limited liability. Yes. Now, what about limited partner par partnerships? In limited partnerships, the distinction is this. You will have one general partner and at least one other limited partner. And here is the definition under section here. Somewhere here in section four. Here. So general partnership, all partners have unlimited liability. Limited liability partnerships, all, partnership, all partners have limited liability. Limited partnerships, you have one or more general partners with unlimited liability, and you also have one or more registered limited partners with limited liability. So that's the distinction between the three. The distinction between an LP or an LLP or an general partnership doesn't arise with regards to the kind of shares or how they distribute their shareholding and so forth. No, because even uh, even what? Even um, even general partnerships, there's a way they there's a way they they do it. There's a way they'll distribute their profits, there's a way they distribute there's a way they'll have their shareholdings. Okay. So you distinguish an LP 
an LLP and a GP based on the liability. For LLPs, all partners have limited liability. For GPs, all partners have okay, for LLPs, all partners have limited liability. For LLPs, limited liability, all of them. For GPs, all partners have unlimited liability. And then for an LP, a limited partnership, you will have at least one general partner with unlimited liability and at least one limited partner with a limited liability. Okay. Now, um, other than the other than um, sorry, other than um, other than that, some of the key points to try and distinguish or to to determine whether something is an LLP or, or whether something is a GP is the fact that for general partnerships, you don't need to register. If three or more people come here and they just they're carrying on business and with the intent of forming an agreement, they don't need to register that uh, GP, and it will still be it will still be what it will still be determined or be concluded that these persons are in a partnership that their business is a partnership and it's a general partnership. For limited liability partnerships and LPs, registration has to happen because every limited lab every limited partner has to be registered. Those are some of the small giveaways. Another thing is with regards to division of responsibilities between uh, the partners in a limited liability, in a, not a limited liability, but in a li limited partnership. So you will have at least one person who's managing the business of a company and the other person who is who doesn't like um, participate in the day-to-day -day running of the, of the company, sorry, of the partnership. So let's try and see if we can open it. part three of the partnerships out. I hope I'm audible enough. Okay, so limited partnerships. So these are some of the give, give, giveaways. A question may not necessarily point out to whether this is an LLP or an LP, but these are some of the things that can guide you towards knowing whether this is an LLP or this is an LP or this is an or this is an uh, a GP. So for a GP, if not one, you don't need to be registered. If they don't mention anything to do with registration, you can presume you can presume that it's a GP. The other one is with regards to division of roles. So for the the role of a limited partner is restricted and they cannot take part in the management of the partnership business. So if you read a question and then they're saying there's one person who manages the business and the other person is just there, maybe you see contributing capital and so forth you automatically click that this question is talking about a limited partnership. That is section 58 of the Partnerships Act. I think those are some of the giveaways when you come to read a question. And now back to this. Let's now analyze this question. In light of what I've said, let's analyze this question. Is this an GP, is this an LLP, or is this an LP? And to be honest, okay. they, uh, uh -huh. It's a, it's a general partnership. Yes, this is a general partnership. It's a general partnership. Yeah. So you see, every Wallace, Daniel, and Richard formed and operated a business named Wendar Capital. Yeah. All the pointers here point towards it being a GP. I don't see anything that's pointing it towards to being an LP or an LLP, everything. At, at the same time, it's not direct. It doesn't show whether this is a part, the GP, LLP, but the pointers, all the pointers from this question point towards this thing being a general partnership. So, and uh, you've adequately answered part A1, and you've adequately discussed and revised partnerships in general and broad. So are we, are we? Are we okay? Maybe the thing that we haven't touched on is uh, limited liability partnerships, but I've touched on it in brief. But yeah, it's an, it's an LLP. So when you think about LLPs, usually think about uh, law firms, how law firms operate, yeah? Um, yeah. And normally LLPs are used in a professional context and uh, so forth. So I think that's it. We can go move on to part A2. Is that fine?
if we move to A2, I think A1 has been sufficiently addressed, unless anyone, Alex, Lavins, no, you need anything, you want to add anything? And in light of that, let's move to A2. Now, A2 is saying, if Richard insisted that he was entitled to receive 34% of the capital and any surplus assets, would he have correctly calculated his proportion of capital and surplus assets? How would you approach that? Analyze and explain fully. This is some of the times you ask yourself, do you need a calculator? You need to start saying 34% of what, 36, you want to start doing some maths, 36, 30, 34. Start doing some additions, subtractions, and mental calculations. Do you really need that? How would you approach part A2? Somebody just uh, it's, it's a discussion. Don't don't fear. How would you approach part A2? I believe, I believe uh, uh, long time, uh, mm -hmm. Richard is not exactly that he was the capital because earlier on in the question, uh, we Richard withdrew a portion of his initial capital contribution mm -hmm. and Wallace left in the book on some 12,000, meaning that the withdrawal from Richard mm -hmm. was overtaken by Wallace. Wallace is 12,000, mm -hmm. so no, he cannot, uh, he cannot take 34%. Um, he's actually entitled to. Yeah, you, you got lost a bit. Are you back? Yes, I'm back. Yeah, okay, okay, uh -huh. I'm gone. Yes, I was saying, um, uh -huh. look at the question. It says, uh, over the course of the next three years, Wallace and Daniel made additional capital contributions, uh -huh. while Richard withdrew a portion of his initial capital contribution. So that means it's a 34% decrease. Further, Wallace left in the business account some 12,000, meaning Wallace's proportion increased. So I don't believe he is rightfully entitled to mm -hmm. receive 34% of the capital. Ah, smart. Thank you. That's that's it. But now, another question. The other thing I would ask, maybe in one, okay, in three words, uh, restrict yourself to three words. What is this question testing? What is this question, question uh, testing? Vision, what is this question testing? It's it's testing section uh, C, winding up or distribution of assets on winding up. It's basically just testing section 41 of the Partnerships Act. And this is why I was saying, it's really important for you to, to, when you're reading for partnerships, just take your time and then analyze, just take the entire act and then uh, read provisions of the act and then summarize its subheading. Let me see if I can take uh, some photos of how I how I how I summarized my partnership suck and then send it to you guys. As you now, I've opened the section to you, 41. Now analyze the question in light of uh, section 41 that has been opened there. Kindly. So I've sent something to the group, and that's uh, this is that's this is a summary I did of the partnerships last year. Don't mind the handwriting. When I was this when I was revising for partnerships, I this it's a picture I took. Somebody borrowed my book, but this is a picture I have, and um, that's how I I that's how I revised for partnerships section by section because it's hard for you to determine you know they just went to a random they went to the partnerships act and took a random section distribution of partners assets on winding up and under section 41 i think it's let's see we see yeah 
The partnership shall pay to each partner any amount owed to him, but excluding the partner's contribution towards the capital of the partnership, on which it shall pay to each partner the amount, if any, which it owes to the partner in respect of capital. Yes? So based on this... Okay. Now, this is a problem with legal text, too much verbose and legalese. So what I did is, uh, the, the, the colleague who just unmuted, kindly read with excluding this bit. Ex exclude the highlighted bits. And then I'll read it to see if you can uh, grasp or, or maybe if it sheds a bit more light. Go on. Yes, uh, you can do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. The, the partner shall pay to the partner any amount on which he shall pay to each partner the amount, if any, which it owes to the partner in respect of capital. Now, my understanding of this section is, and uh, you may be wrong, I may be right, but maybe you could. Maybe you can consult, maybe ask the lecturers or, or maybe amongst yourself. This is my understanding. Yes, in accounting, you'll come to do partnership accounts. You see, when you contribute capital to a partnership, there are circumstances where, okay, there's, there's allotted sum. So, for instance, you're supposed to pay 34% of the capital. Yeah? You're supposed to pay 34% of, uh, let's go back to the question. You're supposed to pay that four percent of uh, of uh, what of sixty. So let's use Richard for instance. Richard is supposed to pay that four percent of sixty thousand. Calculate, calculate. What is that four percent of sixty thousand? Thirty-four percent times sixty thousand. It's twenty thousand. Okay. So what Richard needs to pay in this for for him to come in on board into this partnership is twenty thousand. 400. What if Richard pays 15,000? What will that be? He will be owing the partnership certain amount of capital. True or false? He's supposed to pay 20,000, but he's contributed only 15% so far. I mean, let's go back to it. 34, Richard is supposed to pay 34,000. The capital contribution was 60,000. Initial capital contribution, 60,000. Wallace needs to pay 36, Daniel 30, and Richard 34. 34 of 60,000 is 20,000 and something. But Richard has only paid 15,000 out of the 20,000 which he needs to pay. What will that mean? Will that mean that he owes the partnership the additional 5,400. He owes the partnership, yes? Yes. Now, what if the capital contribution goes above, uh, uh, what's it called? Goes overboard, sorry. So he was supposed to pay 20,400, instead he did 30,000. What happens there? It's vice versa. The partnership now, the partnership now owes who? Owes who? Owes Richard. So I think that's what they are saying. In essence, distribution of a partner's assets on uh, winding up is as simple as the partnership. Mm. 
what in essence I'm trying to contextualize the okay, I don't have a better example for this, but what you see is under section 41, there's a hierarchy in which there's a hierarchy in which distribution of assets needs to happen. Yeah? And before the partners can be uh, can be done what before the partnerships, before the partners can get their capital contribution or the amount that they contributed towards the capital of the partnership, there's certain things that need to be paid. There are certain rules or there's a, there's a certain order that needs to be that's, that needs to be met. So each partner will pay into the partnership whatever the partner owes to the partnership. The partnership shall pay all amount to those two persons other than partners and the partnership shall pay to each partner any amount owed to him but excluding the partner's contribution towards the capital partnership on which it shall pay in respect. So let's say if he paid anything over and above what I was just saying, anything over and above uh, over and aboard uh, the capital contribution, it's money that is being owed to that partner by the partnership. So you will be paid. After he is paid, at this time, it's not the partner's contribution, it's anything that is owed to him by the partnership in respect to the capital that, yeah, the, the capital initial capital contribution, not the partner's contribution, but anything in respect to that. So if he has anything, uh, if maybe he paid overboard in the seconds I gave, he's supposed to pay 20,000, but he pays 30,000. The 10,000 needs to be paid to him under section C. Then D, they will share the profits, the surplus assets in the proportion with regards to the share of partnership profits. And then E, if the partnership is unable to meet its obligations, the partner shall contribute as a deficiency. E, not relevant to the question, but then let's go to F. If a partner is unable to pay to each partner the amount contributed by their partner towards the capital of the partnership, it shall transfer to the partners the remaining assets in equal con proportion to the capital contributed uh, by the partner. Um, what, going back to the question, what section 41? And that's what section A2 requires you to do is just to analyze. Okay, it's true, this person withdrew some of his capital contribution. He's not entitled to the 34 or any surplus assets. What the question wants you to do is, other than saying a simple, because it's five months, other than saying a simple, you know, this person withdrew a portion of his initial capital contribution, so forth and all that, other than saying that, which is totally correct, you need to bring in section 41 of the partnership act and then continue to analyze on how distribution or, or um, any, any surplus assets or any capital contribution or any sharing of profits is done under section 41 of the partnership act. distribution of assets. It's as simple as that. So just want you to analyze section 41 and try and merge it with the fact that this person um, did what? withdrew some of his initial capital contribution. I think that's how you will answer the question. And before you can get your capital contribution, there is that hierarchy. There's, there are those rules that need to be followed under Section 41 of the Partnerships Act on distribution of assets. Are we together up to that point? Amma, are you, I lost you at some bit. Up to them. Yeah, we're together, so long. We're together. So the, six, uh, the the provision for that is 41. 41 read together with the fact that he withdrew some of his capital contribution. It's as simple as that. I don't know why they put five marks, but I think they, that's what they wanted to test. And then B, if Wallace claimed interest payment and then collected profit distribution calculated. So long uh -huh. before we move on, I have a question. Yes. They have given us figures. Well, I can't see the screen right now for some reason, but they have given us figures including 42,500, uh, 127,500, and 170,500. Don't you mm. think that we should use that to answer question two, such that uh, asking if Richard insisted that he was entitled to receive 34% of the capital and any surplus assets? And my reason, my thinking for this is if mm -hmm. he said 34%, which was initially what they contributed under clause mm -hmm. A mm -hmm. of the question, but then mm -hmm. uh, 
at the paragraph it's starting by the end of the year 2017 the business owners net cash contributions after taking full account of the what of the initial capital contribution additional capital contribution etc it means or rather as i have understood it that they mm -hmm. only they created a partnership account where they yeah they basically uh i would say audited statements but they uh calculated uh, everything, including expenses and any other additional capital that was made by the partners, which resulted to the figures that you are given here. So what I think at this particular place, apart from what you've said for the five marks, at, mm -hmm. at add 170, 127, 42, the total okay. I'll get, I'll do 42,500 divided by total times 100 to give me the percentage that Richard uh, is entitled to after we have calculated the partnership account i mean after we have gotten the figures from the partnership account for the year 2017. Does and how, how how much it, it actually does make sense and how much does it come to uh, just give me a minute i do it wait so it will give us 12.5 percent that is his contribution, yes? Yeah. So, yeah. So, the reason why, okay, that's true. You can do the calculations there to add your marks. The reason why I didn't go into the mathematics is that from just from the look, from the, from what, from a brief look at it, you could see that it, it was just a reduction. In essence, he just reduced his uh, initial capital contribution. So, it, it was from 34 to what? To 12%. So yes, you can do the mathematics and uh, the calculations. So just doing it in a bit to save time. It's a reduction. I really, really don't need to go and do the mathematics and then show it there that well, this person reduced from 34 to 12, and this is the reason why I'm giving the answer. It's a reduction, and based on that reduction, is not entitled. Yes, you could do it. Now, for purposes of exams, uh, time may be a tricky bit. So. Since it's already established that you agree with this capital contribution, and then you've actually just seen from me that you do it, then you just go on ahead and analyze and explain. As, as it is, it's totally correct, totally valid to add the mathematics and then to actually, to actually add you more marks. Because you can see I may have given that brief explanation and gone straight to the point and then gotten three marks. But when they see the calculations, they maybe add you an extra mark, maybe one and a half marks and they get one and a half. So yes, don't be limited, go on ahead and do it. It's perfectly valid. That's fine, yes? Yes, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Now, on B, if all is claimed interest payments and then collected profit distribution, calculate the rest of 3% per annum, will he be entitled to payment thereof? That is very straightforward too. You know, since it's revision, you'll go in depth. I'm going to put it towards the sections, then you go and do it in depth. So somebody just mentioned, is entitled to any interest on the uncollected profit distribution? Do you think he's entitled to any interest? Anyone? I don't I don't believe so. But the provisions. Yes. Why why is that? Look, if you look at provision uh, C and D. Uh, mm -hmm. um, the partnership shall pay to each partner any amount owed to him, but excluding the partner's contribution towards the capital of the partnership, or it shall pay to each partner the amount, if any, which it owes the partner in respect of capital, but it does not forego in there. And then if you go to part D, the partner mm -hmm. shall share among themselves any surplus assets in the same proportion as they would be entitled to share the profit, partnership profits. So I don't believe that, I don't see a provision, or in my sense, I don't see a provision if uh, you would be entitled to and then also the if you're working in a partnership the mm -hmm. utmost rule is acting in good faith so if you're working in good faith how can he be entitled to interest where would, where would the interest come from that's the first thing okay but that's good that's good um you've mentioned section 41 what 
41, 3, 4, and I think it's section 10, which talks about good faith. I don't, I don't, I'll check that out. Okay, okay. The quote one, three, good faith. Oh, nice. That's where, like how you brought in the provisions of a law. And then now we go into, oh, that's a good one. That's a good observation. Now, before I go on ahead and now go into analysis, what else can you, what else, what else do you think that question is testing? I've sent me to more Kenya. I've sent more Kenyans in the in the group, I mean, the sections that I put on the partnerships act. If all is claimed interest payment and then collected profit distribution calculated at three percent per annum, will they be entitled to payment there? This question is testing. Uh, it's testing section fourteen. If I'm not wrong, this is it. Section 14, capital contribution by partners. So you're seeing these are some of the things that you'll never hear. Like I don't think they teach even partner partnerships. It's funny the way we were taught partnerships last year. But the lecturer just came and defined what a partnership is, talked about a GP, an LP, and an LLP, and didn't even go into the specifics to bring in the law. And the lecturer was done with partnerships. So the only way you could you can have a better or a good grasp of partnership, it's not even from notes, it's directly from the start, and it's not very lengthy. Because you see, this is something three percent is actually there. It's straight from the section. These are things that they just removed from the act. And now, based on the section that I've given here, section 14, now maybe you'd be in a better place to answer the question. Is it entitled to interest? Yes, 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 14.3. It's uh -huh. uh, actually straight from the Partnership Act. Yeah, you're very right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Please go on ahead and read 14.3. Uh, a partner who makes an advance to a partnership of an amount beyond his contribution to the capital of the partnership is entitled to receive interest from the partnership at the rate of 3% per annum with effect from the date of the advance where prevailing economic circumstances permit 14.3. And it's exactly the 3% they're trying to talk about here. So it's actually yes. a trick question. Yeah, it was a trick question there. So you see, the thing is, you're not entitled to interest on any capital that you contribute to the partnership. That's the overarching uh, uh, or the overarching provision. Under Section 14, a partner contributes capital, but they're not entitled to any interest on the capital contribution. They're only entitled to interest on any advances to the partnership that is made on an amount beyond his contribution to the capital. But then again, I also think this is still a trick question because from the reading of the act, from the reading of the question here, they're not specifying whether this was an advancement that was made. They're just saying this is uncollected profit distribution. So I don't know how you will interpret that question. I leave it now to you, but I've guided you under section three. But if you mention section three there, I'm sure the lecturer will see that this person knows the stuff and then move on ahead and uh, give you and award you the marks. But then the question will be, how, how will you treat uncollected profit distribution? Is it an advancement or is it just capital and uh, un uncollected profit distribution? You just need to collect your profit distribution. Is it an advance? What is an advance in technical terms? What is uncollected profit distribution? Now, after you've defined and uh, after you've uh, distinguished between those two, you can now go on ahead and sufficiently answer on whether he's entitled to 3% per annum. That's fine, yes? I'll leave it at that. I don't, I don't know the answer. Okay, I know the answer to that is section 14. And this, and 14 is that you're supposed to be paid 3% per annum on any advancement you make over and above the capital. So the question is, how do you treat uncollected profit distribution research? Yeah. Okay, so up to there, we, we're, we're okay. We're good to go, yes? Well, are there any questions? But you've now understood how to read for partnerships? Does, does anyone have a question?
I'm sorry. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. um, a partner is then in the process of the partnership. Would that have a bearing in um, that last question? So okay. he cannot claim interest on the profit distribution, but he can claim interest on the capital, the advanced capital in section 14. Um, I'm wow. just section 12 what? 12.1. 12 a partner is entitled to share equally in the profits and is liable to contribute equally towards the losses incurred by the partnership in equal proportions. Mm. So does profit mean <laughs> synonymous to an collected profit? So that I, in my opinion, I would start with that section and then proceed to answer the issue on 3% because they seem to be testing 3% per annum as well, which is as you yes. point out in section 14. So, mm -hmm. and then does equally mean fairly or it's equally as per capital contribution? Would they divide? No. Okay, okay, all right. Ah, that's good, that's good. Now we actually had this discussion and I'll be honest, up to date, uh, we've never agreed on, <laughs> we've never agreed on the specific answer to it. And the question is on, what do they mean by equally? So let's say they are silent. Let's say the partnership date is silent because in essence, the partnership date is the one that's supposed to talk about profit sharing. You know, how will they be distributing profits? Will it be 20%, 80%, 30%, 70% or 50-50? That's something that is usually defined in the what? In the partnership date. So let's say the partnership date is silent. What is the meaning of equally? Because if you read section 12, What is the meaning of equally? It's something we had a discussion because some of my colleagues were saying that, you know, equally means based on the capital contribution. And some of us, I think Alex is not here, but we used to share the same view with Alex that equally means if you, if the partnership did is silent, then profits will be shared 50-50, no matter how, no matter the capital contribution. But then others were of the opinion that were of the opinion that when you share profits or when you share profits, it has to be based on capital contribution. Now that's something that's a question that uh, today we've been discussing and debating with some the lecturers. We asked the lecturers, they need they didn't give us the answers. But maybe I can give you some of the reasons why I will say equally means 50-50. So if we check. There's a certain provision. Maybe somebody can check from the notes that I sent, the WhatsApp, group, the short notes that I sent to the WhatsApp group on sharing of profits. Under the Partnerships Act, there's a provision that states that, okay, the partnerships, partnerships are governed by the partnership deed. And if it's not, or if the partnership deed is silent on a certain provision, then which provisions will apply? The provisions of the Partnerships Act will apply. So there is an honor on persons entering into a partnership to expressly and clearly put um, put to expressly and clearly put and define some of these things, including distribution of profits, distribution uh, how losses will be in uh, distribution how losses will be incurred, and so forth. But if it's not provided, actually, it's here the default rule. It is section six. Oh, wait, sorry. I think it's six five and six variation of a partnership agreement and when the default rule applies. Okay, so that's, you can just check the entire partnership act. But that's the argument we used to have. Because for me, I, I'm of the opinion that if you read, like from a plain reading of the statute, you know, when you talk about statutory interpretation, you begin with the what? You begin with the literal meaning. And if there's any ambiguity pose, you know, go on to look at the purpose intent and so forth. But from a plain meaning, you see it's written, a partner is entitled to share equally in the profits. It's straightforward, it's equally. So for me, I'm thinking it's 50-50 if the partnership did is silent. So that's my opinion. But at the same time, I'm saying others have divergent views. It's never been answered. Maybe one day it will be argued in court and then maybe a definitive answer will be given. But that's, that's it. 
But on regards to section 14, what we're talking about, it's just, uh, you know, you make a capital contribution, you're not entitled to interest on your capital. You're only entitled to interest on an advancement that is made to the partnership. Now, an advancement is maybe, let's say, okay, okay when they talk about an advance, I think they're talking in terms of a loan, or maybe cash. You've given more cash to the partnership over and above the capital that you've done. So the question will be, in this question, how will you treat and and um, and distribute and and collected profit distribution is it um is it de facto and is it de facto an advancement is it will it be automatically treated as an advancement or maybe why you know maybe somebody just decided to have it let it lie over there and then later on when they tabulate they'll pay him up but is it an advancement what is an advancement does it have to be expressly stated as an advancement? Those are some of the questions that maybe maybe you could research on it and then if you have an answer, if you feel like you would want to debate on it one on one, you can give me a call, the Vince or Alex, and then we'll contribute and then we'll, we'll go on ahead and do it. But to, to be honest, what section, what this question just wants you to do is have an understanding of section 14. So if you if I if I was sitting for the exam paper, I will just put section 14. If I talk about it, and I'm sure I'll get the two marks. You know, they're in a hurry. They're not keen to read. They're in a hurry. So what they're doing is they want you to analyze. Bring in section 14, talk about 3% and the fact that, you know, you are not entitled to, to interest on capital. You're only entitled to an adva- interest on any advancements made above the capital contribution. Thank you. Thank you. So five question five is on um, question five is on partnerships. So since we've done partnerships and I'm seeing time is good, let's start with six. And if we have any, and if we have more time, we'll go back to question five. We can start with six, then we'll go back to five. So somebody kindly, uh, quickly maybe read for us question six. Then if we finish it, we go back to question five which is on partner. We've done partnerships, so let's just go to six, do something different, then we'll go back to partnerships. Simon, please. That that a limited liability company. Company has three directors. The directors have approached Africa Bank Limited for a loan to enable them to restock their business, as well as buy two modern cars to match the current demand in the hotel industry. They are aware that the bank could demand security for the loan and have considered charging the companies one acre piece of land, being LR number 148-10, worth Kenya shilling 30 million as collateral. The bank approved a facility of 25 million Kenya shillings upon successful appraisal of the borrower, PABK Limited. The people master has tasked you with an assignment in the file upon receiving instructions from Africa Bank Limited. It requires you to do the following. A. Discuss the legal effect of at least four securities that DABK Limited may create in favor of the lender. Advice on the relevant registries in which the name securities are required to be registered and the timetables of their registration, if any. Discuss other ways in which a company may raise capital. Nice. So I think we went through three. We went through these a few yeah, last year, <laughs> a few weeks ago, but last year when we were talking about securities. Uh, yeah. How how will you answer? How will you approach? Question 6A, kindly, anyone? How will you approach? Uh, maybe let's begin with uh, identify four securities that can be created in favor of the lender. There is a charge. Yes, uh uh-huh. there's a charge. Uh huh. Which kind of charge?
I love that charge. So what do you think? Someone who someone who is in our uh, tuition classes, I love that charge. I tell you, you see, the ones they've said at least four securities. No, here they want you to give at least four, at least four. Discussing their effects. Mm-hmm. Okay, now we can start with the. Uh, we can start with the. Uh, okay, somebody go to the MPSR Act. Let's begin with the basics. Let's begin with the basics. Do deduct. Uh, do the uh, deductivities or something. We remove the most obvious, and then we. Mobile Property Security Rights Act. Now, section four. Hiya, here it is. This section applies to security rights. So these are some of the security things that can be entered into. Now from that, now you can at least answer the question based on this. Now at least give four securities and then give the effects of each. That are, you know, not all of, not all of these don't fall into the question, but some of them do fall into it. Yeah, so long time I, was, I was looking at the question and I, was, I didn't think the MPSI was in there because of the, the title. Hmm? There's like an echo and I'm speaking. Okay, let me sorry. Note. Yeah, thank you. I was looking at the question and I, I was wondering how the MPSR would have entered because, of course, the 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 the, the, the biggest thing and as Noah has, has highlighted is if you look at the question and you have to look at the weddings, the legal effect of at least four securities the DBK may create in favor of the lender. So I only thought about a floating charge and a fixed charge here would be applied. A credit purchase because they could buy the cars through the credit purchase. Um, and those are the three that I had in mind but or a trust receipt or a financial lease a, a trust re, a receipt being just like an iou until uh, but no lender would, would take that on a financial lease would come with a credit um a floating charge then that would mean they would be able the lender would be able to take any property that uh, they would deem fit over dbk assets and a fixed charge would be on the land but um, I wasn't too sure that it would apply here, so I stand guided. Yeah, I know. It's, it's perfectly fine. It does apply. Because if you see the company, okay, this is DABK Limited. It's a limited liability company. The directors have approached Africa Bank Limited to enable them to stock their business, meaning they have, they have stock, yeah? What is stock? Stock is movable property. Also, they, had, they want to buy two modern cars. Modern cars, what, 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 in essence, what are modern cars? These are assets. So these are movable assets. So what are some of the securities? So you see, they, they just hid. They hid those small details in the question to try and trick you. But in essence, this question is testing two things. Uh, there's some small aspect on debentures when it comes to uh, on company laws, company law person to the Companies Act, and there is also the Movable Property Securities Act uh, with regards to movable properties. So all those, all those, all those uh, security or those securities that you mentioned are true, and they are totally valid because you explained each and one, each and every one of them. You explained a financial lease, you explained an IOU, and all those perfectly valid. Additionally, you can have a chattel's mortgage. How does a chattel's mortgage work? What will happen is, let's say, for instance, these two modern cars. These two modern cars will be transferred to the lender. And then once you're done paying your debt, they will be transferred back to you. That's how a chattel's mortgage works. So the two modern cars will be transferred to the lender as security until you finish paying your debt obligations, then they will be transferred back to you. So a chattel's mortgage is one financial lease, uh, you mentioned uh, and that's credit purchase transaction. You mentioned that. You can also have a charge. Now, instead of saying a charge, 
If you read section four, they've distinguished a fixed charge and the floating charge. So put those as two separate things, a fixed charge. So you can, for instance, say there can be a fixed charge on the two modern vehicles and a floating charge on all the assets of the company. So what is the legal effect of that? Well, a fixed charge, you see, once you fail to pay your debt, it's automatic, it's already a fixed, like it's fixed to the two modern cars. But for a floating charge, it hovers over all the assets of the company until a special thing known as crystallization happens. Once crystallization happens, that's when now they attach to a specific uh, asset of the company. And then the last, uh, we actually mentioned more than four. And then now just to go over and abroad, you can talk about uh, this thing, what's it called? Director's deed of guarantee and indemnity. These are the other securities that are usually required by banks. So how does it work? What happens is directors will enter or sign a deed of guarantee and indemnity stating that they will indemnify the lender in the event the what the company is unable to pay its debts and the lender cannot realize the securities. So what happens is the directors themselves give a guarantee. You know, you understand how guarantees work. So if the company doesn't pay its debts, the lender has the right to go after its directors. Okay. Those are some of the securities that can be entered into. That's 6A, and I think we've covered it sufficiently, 6A. We've covered it sufficiently. So section four, talk about floating charges, fixed charges, percent of the companies act, percent of section four of the MPSR, and what my colleague just uh, mentioned, and you are home and dry. And then B, advice on the relevant registries in which the named securities are required. Oh, yes, go on. Go on. So my, my question is on the two modern cars that you've talked about, mm -hmm. uh, because the company is yet to borrow money to buy the modern cars. So mm -hmm. how will we use it as security yet? It has not been bought. It has not been bought. Okay, okay, no, okay, that's fine. I understand. Now, uh, let's, okay. I know this is a commercial paper, but I'll try and explain how this transaction typically would work. For instance, Let's talk about, I'll give two examples. Let's start with land. Okay, not land, but let's say an apartment. You've heard of mortgages, yeah? So what happens in a mortgage is, let's say you've raised 4 million, but the purchase price for the house is, let's say 10 million. So you are short 6 million. What will the bank do? The bank will advance, will advance what? Will advance 6 million to you to buy what? To buy that house. And then, on the registry, on the registry, it's conveyancing. On the encumbrance bit of the registry, you will register a charge. Yeah. So the bank, in essence, has advanced to you a sum of money based on the same same property that you buy. That's one instance. Now let's talk about how people buy cars, for instance, using loans. Okay? So you've raised, let's say, six hundred thousand, and then. Your car is one point, let's say 1.5 million, but you are able to only raise 600,000 and the balance you need to be financed. What will happen? The bank will advance a certain amount of money to you. They'll carry out a valuation, do all those things, but they'll advance the money. But on the logbook, the interests of the bank will be entered. So that's how certain transactions, uh, that's how these transactions typically fall into place. Now, for instance, what I was talking by with regards to the chattel's mortgage is the bank will buy it, will advance you the sum of money to buy the same, but the cars will be transferred in the name of the bank. They will they will be staying there. Like if you check the logbook, it won't be reading, uh, uh, for instance, Michael or Felix, it will be reading the bank. And then after you've repaid the debt, it's transferred back to you. So that's how a chattel's mortgage will happen. But in essence, financing transactions happen this way. Financial institutions will advance to you money and use the same same property or the same same things, or let's say the same vehicle, the same house as a security. Is, is that fine? Have you, have you understood? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So um, that's fine. Then now we go on to, uh, sorry. Yeah, somebody else has a question. Yeah, allow me to talk about the mm -hmm. About debentures, please explain that again. I didn't quite understand what you meant by debentures in essence to this question. Okay, debentures. Debentures is just a floating charge. 
when you talk about a bench, uh, this is a security arrangement, uh, security, this is a security, um, you heard of a debenture document, yes? Yeah. yeah. Now, a debenture is just how can I uh, how can I explain? A debenture is just uh, okay. Let me call it a certificate for lack of a better word. Well, let me call uh, it a document or a character. It's just saying or it's a, it's an acknowledgement that the company owes you this. That the company owes you money, and in the debenture, there is security that will be given. Now, what is the security? The security now will be the assets of the company. Now, how will it fall into place? And that's why I was saying a debenture will in essence just be a floating charge is because the security will be the assets of the company. So whenever you talk about fixed or floating charges, what you're just talking, what you're talking about is, uh, it's just a debenture. You have a debenture under it, there's a fixed charge, there's a floating charge. Let me see if I can get a sample debenture here so as to explain it better. A debenture, let me see if I can get a debenture document. Let me just try and uh, access my emails, but then give me, I can't share my emails. Let me just try and access my emails. And then now we, so I show you how it plays. Okay, now, hey, hey, now this thing, you know, Nisha, uh, it's showing, it's showing work information. No, I don't know. <laughs> now, I can't really project this thing. Okay, let me see if I can crop and then I project it to you so that you see it. Eh? I think the details of the company is being shown, but let me just project right now. Now, look at my screen here. No, can you see it? Yes, I can. So, what is happening? This is an encumbrance. <clears throat> These are company such. It's actually answering my question. So, I'll expect you to answer question two for me. But this is a debenture. It's an encumbrance over what? So, I've done a company such, meaning this is an encumbrance and over, over what? Over the assets of a what? Assets of a company. Okay. So what this type of debenture, what this debenture was, what was being registered here when you talk about this debenture, it was an all asset debenture. Meaning this debenture is securing this financial facility, which is 90 million. So this company has been advanced 90 million. It's an all asset debenture over the company, meaning as security, this all asset debenture is covering assets worth how much? 90 million. 
Yeah. So what is an all asset debenture? If you look at it, what is an all asset debenture? Another word for an all asset debenture. Floating charge. It's a floating charge in essence. So you have a floating charge over all the assets of a company. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> an all asset debenture hovers over all the assets of a company. Now, it, there may be circumstances where it's only on a specific specific asset, then that becomes a fixed charge. And that's why I was saying, there's a debenture, and on a debenture you can have a fixed charge or a floating charge. But in this circumstance, it was an all asset debenture securing 90 million advance to this company over all the assets of the company. Now let me close that and go back to the question. Going back to the question, you can see this is a company. The company has three directors. So this company has various other stocks other than the two vehicles, you know, restocking. They are restocking, meaning they have other stocks, meaning they have other movable properties, they have other assets over the company. A debenture will be a security. Why? Because this debenture will offer protection or will cover all the assets of a company for the sum that is advanced to this company. Okay, so in essence, I mentioned debenture, but what I'm talking about is just a floating charge over all the assets of a company, an all asset debenture over the assets of a company. Have you understood up to that point? I'm a EST, Nimeku. I've lost you at some place. I've understood. You've understood, yeah? So some of these things, don't even worry if you're not getting them. You will go into farms, you will do judicial attachment, and then these things will now will become practical. You will realize them slowly. So don't 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 worry. It's straightforward. It's easy. The dependency is just a, it's a floating charge or a fixed charge. An all asset debenture. What is it? An all asset debenture is just a floating charge. Okay. Now, since I since I opened that thing for you, advice on the relevant registries in which the named securities are required to be registered and the timelines of the registration, if any. So a debenture, where is it registered in the first place? Where is the debenture registered? I just opened it right now. In this case, it is company. Yes, company. Yes, company. Yes, company. company. Yes, company. Uh -huh. And the other one? The MPSR. MPSR. MPSR registry. Yeah. Now, let's look So long as we really have MPSR registry or it's called uh, just a name. Collateral is the name, the name is collateral. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Just, <laughs> yeah, let me see it. Let's look at it. BRS websites. Okay, you learn a lot of these things in this website. That's one website you need to check. I don't know if I have the logins here. It's my work computer. It is a list, it is a normal. Yeah, here is the. You go to the business registration service. So you open the e-citizen portal. You go to the BRS website. After you go to the BRS website, you load the notice. That's how you register. So this is the collateral. Okay, it's the collateral registry. It's it's the same thing. Collateral registry, MPSR registry. It's just the same thing. Okay. Whatever you name it, it's the same thing. Okay. Now this is another good document. You can just search it, and then you. We'll get access to it. So, what are the timelines now? What are the timelines? Fourteen days. It's. 
14 days for the collateral register. Which section of the law? I'm not sure. Okay, let me just open for the for the companies is the one that I'm sure. So let's start with the companies. Is the companies act here? So for the companies, um, it's starting from eight hundred and seventy something. Here it is. It depends on let's go to the floating and fixed charges. Company charges, yeah. So for company charges, I think it's 30 days. Within 30 days of creation of, uh, let's see the specific section. It's usually somewhere here. It's, it's pretty straightforward here. Yeah. The deadline for registration of a charge is 30 days uh, from the day in which the charge is created. So for the charge, 30 days. So for the company's registry, this is for the company's registry, you need to do it within 30 days from when the charge is created, okay? That's for the company's registry. Now for the MPSR, let me check. I'm not sure about that one, so I won't lie about that. Let me see your property security rights. Check, section 29. 29, let me see. Time of effectiveness of a registration of a notice. So the registrar uh, 29, which subsection? Twenty-nine of the MPSR twenty-nine. Twenty-nine three, sorry. Twenty-nine three, okay. The registrar shall enter information in a notice into the records of the registry without delay after the notice is submitted and in order in which each notice was submitted. And then four. And four. The and record four, shall. Right. Okay. The record shall. Re, the registrar shall record the date and time when the information in a notice is entered into the records in the registry. As it mentioned, a specific timeline. Like for instance, you see under the Companies Act, they are saying. Um, you see, like for the one for the Companies Act, in thirty days, it has to be within thirty days. The no, this, it doesn't. They haven't mentioned it doesn't. So for the MPSR, I'll do, okay, I'll do more research for the MPSR and then get back to you. But for the company's registry, you have to do it within 30 days. The deadline for registration of a charge created by a company is within 30 days from the day in which it is created. So it's 30 days for a company's registry. That's fine. Huh? And then I'll do the research for the other one and then discuss the other ways in which a company may raise capital. How do companies raise capital? There are two main ways in which a company raises capital, which can now be branched into others. Debt and equity. Yeah, debt and equity, yes. Now debt from loans, what else? Okay, let me loans, sana sana. Okay, how about equity financing? They can sell their shares. What else? They can sell shares, equity financing, selling shares. So a company carries on business, so they can raise capital also based on uh, the earnings of the company. Debt financing. Private equity and debt financing. Or private equity. Yes. yes. Okay, yes, private equity. Uh -huh. Public deposits. Public, uh, these are heavy terms. Now explain them, please. For public deposits, private equity. Explain them. Um, private equity is where they can get an, an external investor who can, uh, can be given probably some stocks in the company in exchange for their investment. That's one way.
What? Sorry, I was muted. Was I speaking the entire time while being muted? Or could you hear me then all of a yeah, sudden? Yeah. You, you were muted. Uh, so the entire time I was talking, I was muted. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you were muted. Yes. Yeah, sorry. 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 I was I was just talking. I was saying a commercial is a fairly easy unit. Today we've covered we've covered uh, partnerships, we've covered companies, and we've covered insolvency, and we've covered some bit of MPSR. So the thing to do with commercial, as I've taught you, what to how to read about it. For instance, the partnerships. I've shown you how to read for partnerships. When it comes to partnerships, you need to look at the statutes. With the statutes, partnerships, it's a fairly short statute. So you need to look at the partnership set and the LLP Act. It's fairly easy to grasp. The other one that you need to check on companies, don't read the entire companies act, just read the main provisions. Use your course outline. If the course outline talks about preemptive rights, go to the section that talks about preemptive rights. Okay, that's how you read for commercial. It's a fairly easy unit. I don't, it's a fairly easy unit. Don't be scared with it. It's easy. It's manageable. So, I that's that's all I have for today. I think I hope I hope that the revision was adequate. It's opened uh, your eyes on commercial transactions, and you now have a grasp of how to approach some of these questions. Uh, Simone, it's not hard. I'm, I'm a, I, I don't think. You've seen how we've done. It's not hard. It's something doable. It's workable. Eh? But the most, uh, the most key thing you need to note is to pay attention to the small details, small details and the questions. And I think that's that's it. So I'd invite Lavins and uh, Noah, whoever is in, to maybe the Sunday night. You can close for today. I think we've covered broadly. The only question we haven't do is the other question on partnerships. But yeah. Because we've already covered partnerships in depth up there, and the other one was fairly easy. So I'd rather we moved to MPSR so that we cover at least another topic that hasn't been covered in commercial. So by the time April comes, we'll have done several of these past paper questions and we'll do all. So when it comes to accounting, I, I to be honest, I don't I am not well placed to teach accounting, but I'll ask a friend of mine who used to help me out in accounting to see if I can come to do for one of these classes. And then maybe we can pick a question on accounting, a past paper question, and then we can come and work out that question with you as he explains those basic concepts to you. Maybe we can try at the week after next week or some adequate time. And uh, that's it. That's it for me, unless anyone has uh, feedback on how we should go on about this revision exercise. Navins, you can, you can take over, please. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bro. It's been uh, quite an uh, entertaining and uh, purposeful engagement. So we've, uh, we've given you exactly just uh, the backbone of uh, what commercial transaction is all about. So our step progresses, you would uh, just uh, give what's remaining to sort of make it a fully functional human mind. So maybe perhaps by next month, you'll have the heart. The other month, you have the soul. So by the time you get to the exam room, then it's all systems go. So like Solonka said, it's a very fair unit to pass. You don't have to panic. And it's the unit that you shouldn't dare ret retake. Just during the first time you pass it, don't retake this unit. I beg you and I do implore, don't you dare retake this unit. Pass it at the first instant because it's doable. So long as you get the basics right, so long as you understand what each and every word or uh, sentence, you know, imply, then I think you wouldn't have quite some rough time. So next weekend, I think we will uh, discuss with the team on what paper we can do. So step progresses, but the time you get to the exam room, I think we should have covered all those past papers. So all the best once again, as we keep brushing through your, uh, your books. So, Believe in yourself, read, 
read and read. What you don't understand, we are here. Try to reach out to us. We could explain what you can, despite our busy work schedule for the entire week. But uh, we will set up some type ups in the evening. I do respond to text messages. Depends what time, but I always respond. So yeah, so you can reach out to the rest of the team members. We are all key players. So at the end of the day, we have to win the game. So you have a blessing, um, a blessed rather night or evening. But read again, and may God's grace be sufficient upon you. So thank you. Uh, so longer back to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now, uh, to our colleagues, do you have anything, any question before you break it off for the weekend? Yeah, do you have? Okay, that's fine. Now, the person who's kindly recording, please stop the recording and then maybe tomorrow you can try and uh, try and kindly help us out to replace it so that I post it. Who's recording? Maybe we could stop the recording. <laughs>